So, books, huh? I don't like to read them. Although I'm willing to make an exception this one time. Just for you, Freddy Fazbear. The Five Nights at Freddy's series has become one of the few regular topics I talk about on this channel, among the ranks of Family Guy and the Fairly Odd Parents. A series which I loved back in 2014 when it first came out, dropped off around the release of the fourth game, only to come back in full swing when I decided to drop an hour-long retrospective on the entire franchise back in October of 2020. And since then, I've pretty much been keeping up with everything new coming out related to the series, even making a few more videos along the way. We don't talk about that one. If you somehow clicked on this incredibly niche topic discussion with no prior knowledge of the franchise, first of all, hi, I guess I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown to get you up to speed. Five Nights at Freddy's is an indie horror series that got its start back in 2014 with the release of a simple point-and-click game, where you take the role of a security guard having to protect yourself during the night shift from four killer animatronic robots, who aim to grab you and stuff you inside one of the suits found at the location, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. With the game's subsequent and immense popularity, the series creator Scott Cawthon started to whip out countless sequels, 11 to be exact, on top of branching out to plushes, board games, and toys. Lots of toys. And the topic of today's video books. Despite the initial games appearing quite straightforward in terms of what was going on in them, the ever-growing fanbase quickly started to realize that there was much more going on with the plot of the Freddy's universe under the surface, with Scott undoubtedly capitalizing on this with future entries attempting to sprinkle bits and pieces of story throughout, some in super goddamn cryptic ways. And even if you question some of the ways this is presented in the games, or if Scott has even planned out any of this and isn't just coming up with new stuff as he goes along, which he is, Clearly one of the main draws to the series is the lore, drip-feeding the story out of order and forcing fans to figure out how each thing connects to the other. It may seem dumb, but it's actually a genius way to keep fans talking and becoming more dedicated to the series. And because of this affection towards the series' story, I guess Scott thought it'd be a smart idea to simply cut out the middleman of, you know, playing the games, Was that the and release a series of books revolving around the franchise. And don't be fooled! These are much more than basic retellings of the events present in the video games. Instead, they're entirely new stories, separated from the main franchise. I think, as you're going to soon see, it gets rather confusing as we go on. I I'm just going off this quote from the man himself, which reads, The games in the book should be considered to be separate continuities, even if they do share many familiar elements. So yes, the book is canon, just as the games are. That doesn't mean they're intended to fit together like two puzzle pieces. Yeah, that sure clears everything up. Brilliant. No, I, I never really paid much attention to these things. My FNAF hype train was going strong for a long time. I was watching all the game theories, all the Markiplier Let's Plays, and getting ready to buy the new action figures coming out. But once they finally hit UK store shelves, I'd already dropped off. So reading wasn't really going to be the thing to entice me back in. It's crazy to think about when these things first released. I recall thinking, oh god, they really jumped the shark here, didn't they? This fad is on its way out. And now here I am, owning them all seven years later. I will say, however, every now and then I'd hear something about them or see people on Twitter discuss the new installments, which started to pique my interest. Not always in the most positive way, like the rumblings of Springtrap Vor or something, I really am not looking forward to some of these. As the time of writing this video, there are currently 21 books released, and by god was this horrible to prepare for. Okay, so not only is there a trilogy of novels, but then there's another series of 11 anthology books, each featuring three unrelated stories with an ongoing story happening in each of them, and also a bonus 12th book which you can only get from buying the full set of 11 in a collector's box, meaning I now just have a couple duplicates laying around, like great, my new chair is a bit wobbly, this'll do the trick. And on top of that, there's a new anthology series, I think, based off the newest game, FNAF Security Breach, as well as three graphic novels which adapt the stories from the original trilogy, and then another graphic novel which illustrated some of the stories from the first anthology series, and... I'm doing it all. So, the way this is going to work is I'm going to start by talking about the first trilogy of books, followed up by their graphic novel counterparts just to discuss whatever differences there may be between them. Then I'll go to talk about all 12 books in the Fazbear Fright Saga, same thing goes with its graphic novel, and finally end it with the currently released books in the new Teals from the Pizzaplex series. Sound good? Alright, great. So without further ado, let's finally read and discuss every single Five Nights at Freddy's book. No, I'm not doing the guides. But first, if there's one thing I love to read, it's definitely all the descriptions of amusing products I can buy over on Manscaped.com. Well, come on, not all the transitions are gonna be winners. You guys are sure to know Manscaped by now, with all their amazing men's grooming products, such as the Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer. But did you also know that they now have a Performance Package 4.0? Not only does it have a weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer, crop preserver ball deodorant and crop reviver toner, but also the amusing performance boxer briefs. They also have their Shears 2.0, a luxury Neil grooming kit, 
This kit includes stainless steel nail cutters, tweezers, and grooming scissors. With the performance package, your boys will be ready to impress, but make sure you cover the rest. Once again, your balls. So be sure to go to manscaped.com to get 20% off, plus free international shipping, and also be sure to check out their new ultra smooth package. And thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. To start off our painfully long endeavor, we have the 2015 release, Five Nights at Freddy's, The Silver Eyes. I mean, we have a lot of great reviews like, best book in existence, other than a lot of other great books. To start in a completely unrelated note, did you ever realize how many books says somewhere on the cover something about being a New York Times bestseller? With this one being no different, you ever notice that literally every single book under the sun says that somewhere? It can't be that hard to obtain. It seriously makes me consider why they even put it on there. It's like your kid proudly displaying their participation medal on their wall. You really think you did something. At first I was starting to worry about how hard it would be trying to keep track of all these books. Until I saw they have these handy dandy collections. With this one containing the first three novels. Apparently it even has a bonus poster inside. You can take it back. But just keep in mind that these are re-releases. And while the content of the book itself is exactly the same, there are some external differences, with the main one being the cover art. The original featured a very close-up shot of Fredward Fazbear, and his patented not silver eyes, in front of a background very akin to the title screen of FNAF 4 with Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy standing ominously in the distance. FNAF 4 was the most recent game at the time, so I guess it makes sense. Saying that though, the book has next to nothing to do with that game, so fuck me, I guess. Who needs cohesion? Not for me! I'm just gonna eat me a big old bag of cheese balls! <laughs> they ended up changing the cover eventually, although not much is different. Instead, having Freddy on the other side of the thing with the camera even more close to his face. And yep, these models sure weren't meant to be looked up at this close. Nice mesh, Freddy, did your mummy make it for ya? I can only imagine they did this to try and have it fit among the other two, which follow a similar pattern. Checks out. Eh, wanna see something scary? <gasps> now you may be asking yourself, Mark, I've seen you review TV shows, movies, games, y yourself, but how are you gonna review a book? To the best of my ability. Obviously, a big thing here is that books contain these cryptic ancient markings called words, so it's not gonna be as easy as a movie or a game where I can simply play footage. And so to get around this, I'll be using footage from the three graphic novels that were released based on these books. Yeah, hi. When Mark said that he was going to be using footage from the graphic novels for this video, uh, he really meant me. Because, uh, I'm editing this video. But hey, at least I'm not the one stuck reading 20 bucks in a couple weeks, am I right, fellas? But no, that isn't the original format it was released in, and that we're going to cover those separately later. But other than that, it should mostly work the same way. I'll discuss the story, characters, pros and cons, same as my other videos. Just don't expect me to talk about every single detail beat by beat, I think that's a pretty boring way to cover media. I mean, if you just wanted to sit and listen to me talk about every single story beat in order, then just go and listen to the audiobook at this rate. Or, you could go and listen to my audiobook. That's right, I've went and recorded audiobooks of me reading each of these three novels. Hi, uh, Mark here. Turns out what I wanted to do was very, very illegal, so I couldn't do it at the last minute, but just know, I so fucking would've. I'm trying to get it cleared up right now with some people to see if I can end up doing it, so if I do in the future, you'll see a little card in the top right. But in the meantime, you should check out the new podcast episode I did on my brand new podcast channel. Not only did we just release a new episode of Jeff Kinney, but we also talked with Kellen Goff, the voice of Glamrock Freddy. Go check it out. But I've stalled for long enough. Here's FNAF The Silver Eyes. I guess the best thing about reviewing a book is that there's no better way to describe to you what it's about than reading the blurb on the back. Let's see what we're in store for. Ten years after the horrific murders at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza that ripped their town apart, Charlie, whose father owned the restaurant, and her childhood friends reunite in the anniversary of the tragedy, and find themselves at the old pizza place which has been locked up and abandoned for years. After they discover a way inside, they realize that things are not as they used to be. The four adult-sized animatronic mascots that once entertained patrons have changed. They now have a dark secret, and a murderous agenda. Why did they need to specify adult-sized? Did Guptil84 write this? She's attractive and is the size of an average human mother. The best way I can describe the story here is that it's much like IT Chapter 2, with our main character, Charlie, coming back to her hometown of Hurricane, Utah, to meet up with her best friends from 10 years prior, who had all sort of drifted apart after the events that occurred at a family eatery called Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. From the get-go, there's a lot of mystery setup revolving around Charlie. We see her visit her old house, to be met by her childhood animatronics like Stanley the Unicorn and Ella the Doll. Obviously, being a book, we can't see what they look like, so I'm just gonna use their amazing Funko Pop forms. 
There's quite a few things we're not told about from the get-go, like who Charlie's father is, what happened to him, and most importantly, the event that caused a majority of them to leave town and not come back until now. We're eventually let known of the situation that occurred that day, what caused the restaurant to be shut down, being that five kids mysteriously went missing on the premises, with the bodies having never been found. One of the kids being Michael, a close friend of Charlie and her peers with them returning to the opening of a scholarship program being started by his parents in memory of their son. They do a good job at piecing out their surprises here. Every time I felt it was starting to drag, they successfully managed to pull me back in by throwing another bit of information that starts to put everything more into perspective, with each twist and turn building off the last, painting a greater picture of why all these disparate ideas are related to each other. We learn about a previous restaurant Charlie's father owned called Fred Bear's Family Diner, that her father is the one who invented the animatronics, and that Charlie in fact had a brother called Sammy, who was one of the kids that had gone missing. With her father being so stricken by grief that not only did he and his wife separate, but that this event caused him to lose himself, going crazy and building an animatronic that would kill him. And possibly the biggest reveal it had is that her father, Henry, had a partner, William Afton, who was shown to be quite envious of his partner, which assumably causes him to go crazy and kill the kids, including Henry's son, stuffing them inside the suits of the animatronics. Reading the book for the first time today, I was quick to not really focus on that very much, but I was forgetting that around the time of release, none of this was well known. I had seen William Afton's name thrown around so frequently in the community and in memes and such, that I forgot it all started with this book. Revealing your main villain's name 350 pages into a spin-off book. Nobody but you, Scott. You may be noticing that I'm hardly mentioning the stars of the show themselves, Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. But that's only because they're seldomly used here. They don't even come alive until the final encounter. It may sound weird, but the book shows a surprising amount of restraint when it comes to that sort of stuff, mainly using them for bigger moments, trying to give it more impact. I don't know why, but when I was going in, I was half expecting it to be non-stop thrills and spills, with the animatronics always being on the move after our characters, with Freddy cracking jokes and hitting the gritty. But no, it's actually got a very slow pace, which is welcome. The characters freely roam to and from the Freddy's establishment, with seemingly no danger the first two times, being open to leave and come back at later points, with them only being able to get in through a hidden door to the restaurant that's inside an abandoned mall, with it being built around the pizzeria, almost to contain it in a way. Things don't really begin to pick up until the introduction of a night guard, Div, who insists on joining the crew while they explore the place until the ground reveal that he is in fact William Afton, masquerading as part of the police force so that he can guard the restaurant, I assume to ensure nobody ever enters and finds out what he did, where he then dons his iconic golden bunny suit, aiming to take the lives of our protagonists by stuffing them inside Springlock suits. But just who are these characters? I mean, if the book is less focused on Freddy and more so the events that transpired and how they affected our protagonists, then I'd hope they're at least interesting. I think Charlie works well enough as our hero. She's this awkward, anxiety-ridden girl who can't help but overthink every situation. There are so many points in the book where she says something, and immediately we see her questioning it in her mind. They do a very good job at letting you know what her life was like and how these situations have affected her every day, oftentimes having nightmares from the past, or questioning if certain events even happened, suppressing the traumatic experience that she witnessed as a kid such as watching William take away her brother, and walking into her living room and seeing an animatronic wielding the knife that killed her father. I even enjoy the smaller moments featuring her simply talking to one of her friends about life and how she doesn't really have much of an idea of what she wants to do. Point being, if Charlie is going to be the character we follow throughout these three books, then I'm happy to say I'm invested in seeing where it goes with her. The friends themselves are more hit and miss, however. We have some that I like well enough, such as John, Carlton, and Jessica. Well, enough for me not to want them to die, at least. Like the whole part with Carlton stuck inside a Springlock suit, knowing any sudden movement could cause it to clamp shut and puncture his organs. It was very tense and well done. But then we have others like Marla, Jason, and Lamar, who I don't really feel added very much. I think between the three of them, the only thing that happens is Jason sneaks off inside the pizzeria by himself, giving them a reason to want to immediately try and get in to rescue him, which kicks off the final showdown. But by that point, Carlton was already trapped by the purple guy, so they didn't seem all that necessary to me and only served to tick up Spius. Who knows, maybe it's psychological. The three of them are only introduced after they visit Freddy's for the first time, so by that point, I already had time to get to know and connect to the first four, and my heart just didn't have room for three more. But either way, didn't mind them, I suppose. If there's one thing that definitely did stick out to me, was how I didn't really buy them as teenagers. We have them saying shit like, I was gaga for him, like, really. Seems more like something an older person would assume a teenager would say. I feel like a real teenager in this scenario would say something more akin to, I don't know, I wanna fuck him. And on top of that, there are so many moments where I see this working more if they were much older, or at the very least in their early 20s. Not only with the way they talk to each other about catching up on their lives, but the scenario itself is weird. I mean, if I were a parent, I don't think I'd trust my 17-year-old kid to go to a different state alone for the memorial of their old friend who was murdered in that town. 
I mean, I join them. Still, though, it's not a huge deal. And they do a lot more stuff that I like than don't, which helps me still have an overall positive opinion on it, such as all the clever integration of elements from the video games like the camera system and elements like the souls of the kids. Golden Freddy even makes a cameo as the spirit of their friend Michael. If anything, I think this book would be an excellent framework for the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, which apparently it was, until Scott eventually scrapped it in favor of something else, and then scrapped that one in favor of who the fuck knows. That movie is still in production hell. I swear to god, I mentioned that back in my original 2020 video, and since then what we know about it has remained exactly the same. What are you hiding, Jason? The book ends with the reveal that the animatronics weren't actually after our main characters, instead only being after them because they've been dead for so long and any adult triggers back their memories of being taken by the dastardly clutches of William Afton, who Charlie kills by purposefully activating the spring locks on the golden bonnie suit he was wearing. We all know where this is going. And with that, we're officially done with the first book. I could sit here and point out dumb minor errors, like on high page 193 they forgot to have the word in be in italics, but who fucking cares about that shit? The only thing worth mentioning in that regard is that while it does a good job at describing things in a way that paints a picture accurately, there are a few odd times where the wording is a bit bizarre. Like, I don't know, describing William Afton as a financially shrewd Santa Claus isn't the most intimidating image. I wasn't expecting it when going in, but I find it to be a thoroughly enjoyable time. Like I said before, I was mostly predicting a dumb baby book, not hesitant to overstimulate you with wacky cartoon characters ripping people to shreds and showering in the blood raining down from their corpses. But this was actually a fairly engaging story about a young girl and her friends uncovering the mysteries of their past. I will say though, I'm curious about where this story is gonna go, as it ends with Charlie and friends once again moving on, implying she has no interest in seeing them again as it reminds her too much of what happened. But I guess one thing's for sure, no matter what, it's gonna be twisted. Wait, no, that doesn't make sense, I didn't show the title card yet. Two years later, we got the long-awaited sequel to The Silver Eyes, Five Nights at Freddy's, The Twisted Ones. The cover for this one is super cool, teasing at us this blackened, demonic-looking Freddy Fazbear, covered in strangely textured loose wires and bloodshot red eyes, almost like he's... twisted? <laughs> It's been a year since the horrific events at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and Charlie is just trying to move on. Even with the excitement of a new school and a fresh start, she's still haunted by nightmares of a masked murderer and four gruesome animatronic puppets. But when a series of bodies are found near her school bearing wounds that are disturbingly familiar, she finds herself drawn back into the world of her father's frightening creations. Something twisted is hunting Charlie, and this time, if it finds her, it's not letting her go. I like picturing these as if they're being announced in a movie trailer. This summer, Freddy Fazbear is gonna get twisted. Also, I just wanted to point out that I'm just now noticing in other regions these books have different covers. Like, look at this fucking abomination that the Turkish were forced to deal with while they waited for the official version. Glad they decided to point out to us that Toy Freddy's dick is an amaler. I hope it gets better. As the blurb suggests, the Twisted Ones quickly gets us acquainted to the new lives our protagonists from the last book are leading, with Charlie going to college for robotics, sharing a dorm with Jessica, and John just so happens to have gotten a construction job over in Hurricane, where there's recently been a storm that nearly demolished Charlie's father's house. It's interesting that they decided to cut out over half the main cast from the last book. Marla makes a small cameo at the end and Carlton is only ever mentioned a couple times, but the rest got the axe. Gotta say, not shedding a tear over this change honestly. The story for this one involves Charlie being haunted by nightmares of her brother, who if you remember was taken by William Afton when they were young. She swears that a part of her is missing without him and can almost hear him calling for her, like he's trapped in a box and needs her help getting out. There's very much so a theme going on throughout the book of holding on to things, becoming obsessive and needing to let go of the past. Charlie is clearly suffering from memories of her father and what happened last year at Freddy's, with her friends at multiple points questioning her sanity, with a room overflowing with parts, wires, and bizarre contraptions almost like she's beginning to follow in her father's footsteps. Something I noticed soon in is that the pacing here is way worse compared to the first, most likely because that one had a pretty standard and basic concept to get around, but the Twisted Ones feels like it takes forever to start. The perfect example of the book's horrible pacing is that there's this big intense moment near the end where Charlie is eaten by Freddy and is being taken to some mysterious place she doesn't know, any sudden movements triggering the spring locks and resulting in her death, and when John, Jessica, and Carlton's father, Claire, get to the house to try and find something that'll help them know where she's being dragged to, they then, for some reason, all fucking just sit down and let Claire discuss why his wife left him for four pages. Charlie's potentially being murdered, and here we are watching a goddamn therapy session. That's all during the end, though. For the first 200 or so pages of the thing, it's got such a slow pace. 
focusing on the characters and what they're doing in their everyday lives. They explore way more of her interpersonal relationships, with Charlie and John going out on dates and such, which I wouldn't have a problem with if it weren't for the fact that these don't seem like real people. I'm not engaged with their romance. Charlie flat out says they have nothing in common except for Freddy's, and she proves to him that she's nothing more than a crazy lady, arriving to their dates late and covered in muck and bruises, and when he simply asks what's going on, she yells at him like, I'm surrounded by monsters and murder and death and spirit- Uh, yeah, I think I'll take the check to go. <laughs> Don't worry though, this sort of dialogue isn't just restricted to the romance stuff. We get all your classic Marvel one-liners like, We're not at Freddy's anymore. That is a real line set here. They break up the romance shit with the shocking news that bodies are starting to show up around the place, covered in the same scarring that's caused by the Springlock suits, with them eventually finding the pattern that there are these twisted animatronics that rise from the ground at night, walk towards where Charlie's college is, then bury themselves come morning, wanting to strike again. And what's even worse is fake blood was found at the same spot where William supposedly died in the last novel. So you know what that means. The most apparent thing to me with Twisted Ones is how much more they were starting to lean into surreal concepts and ideas. Like of course, a story about Chuck E. Cheese animatronics being possessed by dead kids isn't the most grounded thing out there, but they definitely balanced it well to the point where it at least felt natural. But here, there is no restraint, they go off the fucking walls. Most prominently, there's this whole idea of illusions that they explore. They even do that generic movie thing, where coincidentally Charlie's lecturer is exploring this very idea in the first paragraph. But Charlie and John find this disc inside one of the twisted animatronics, which emits this screeching noise which somehow alters the way you perceive the robots. Trying to lure in kids through presenting Freddy and Co is much more friendly, when in reality they look much more akin to… well this guy. I'm not really sure how I feel about this idea. See, it's implemented well enough. Within the confines of the book, it makes sense. Kinda. And there are certain moments which I think executes upon it well, such as the whole part where Charlie, who by the way has fucking balls of steel in this book, which only makes her come off as less relatable, literally locking herself in an empty house right where she knows the animatronics are gonna be, she doesn't even have a plan really, she just knows they want her, and in the end gets fucking swallowed alive by Freddy, appearing like a carnival attraction with blinking lights and such. Which, visualizing it in my head is a really cool idea. I wanna see how that would look. But there's stuff like that filling the entire ending confrontation. But despite how not awfully it was executed on, there's still something about the idea that remains so… dumb, there's no better way to put it. There's this line on page 165 which I think perfectly sums up my thoughts on it, being, it almost makes sense, but not quite. What's even worse is that by the end it straight up feels like a Five Nights at Freddy's fan fiction. There is so much fan service here that feels like it wasn't necessary. Like, a spooky FNAF book should not include parts where all the robots are fist fighting and somebody says, It's a Fortnite battle royale out there! Well, okay, I may have added the Fortnite part. Like, there are parts such as, The original Bonnie grabbed the torso of the twisted Bonnie and threw it aside where Chica waited. It's just pages and pages of shit like this, it's legit a FNAF action scene. When they arrive at Claire's house, we learn that he actually went back to the same Freddy's location from the first book, taking all the animatronics home and storing them in his basement. And so John has the bright idea to go down to them and try to communicate, hoping for them to somehow know where Charlie's being taken away to. And it fucking works? The whole ending here is a neat concept, with Charlie being locked inside an unknown pizzeria, filled with what she later learns to be illusions of more twisted animatronics, like a twisted Bonnie, a wolf, and a bunch of childlike ghosts which turns out to be nothing more than silly little balloon boys. But where it started to lose me is through the fact that it drags on and on and on. Every time you think it's about to end, it just keeps going. And this is the shortest book too, with the previous being 400 pages and this only being 300. But while I got through that first one in around two days, this took like four because it just gets so boring at points. Either over explaining concepts or details, like when Charlie enters the empty house I mentioned before, and we get like three pages just describing how all the furniture is fake. There's world building and then there's just filling pages. Or they're trying to get through like eight different plot points one after the other with no breathing room and it just becomes draining. Okay. So, when John, Jessica, and Claire come to rescue Charlie in the pizzeria, and after Claire does the most reasonable thing I've ever seen somebody do in a FNAF setting and fucking shotguns Freddy Fazbear in the head, we hear the sound of a familiar character, after Charlie questions why they brought her here. They don't care about you. I'm the one that brought you here! I was very much so excited to see them incorporate my favorite character Springtrap into the book, with William having been fused with the bunny suit as a rotting undead corpse but my happiness was immediately shattered once he kept running his mouth. I've accepted the new life you gave me. 
You've made me one with my creation. My name is Springtrap. Springtrap calling himself Springtrap makes Springtrap well less cool. It's a strange approach to take him in, and not one that I'm too fond of. I don't like the idea that William is not only acting completely normal while inside the suit, well, okay, relatively normally as a child murderer. Like, the idea that in FNAF 3, this guy could stand around and have a pleasant conversation makes him way less intimidating. But also, I don't like that he's happy about the fact that he's not stuck inside his creation. Like, wasn't the whole idea behind him activating the spring locks and dying inside the suit being that it was an ironic death? Being subjected to the same torture he put his victims through? But him enjoying it just sort of undoes all that, doesn't it? I don't know, if you have a different perspective on this, let me know. But, in my opinion, wouldn't it be a cooler idea if he instead resented the hand he was dealt? Having a blinding rage towards Charlie for being imprisoned in such a gruesome way. Wanting to put her through the CMP and he has to endure every single day for the rest of eternity. I don't know. I'll, I'll never know, because it never fucking happened. Nothing is more fitting to me than this page being forever ruined in my book because I accidentally sneezed on it. The ending to this book had me really disappointed. Like I mentioned before, things just keep happening and they don't know when to call it quits. So, after a bunch of running around, they defeat the twisted animatronics. Then Charlie starts to go further into the place to chase after Springtrap while it's all falling apart, wanting to know why she took her brother and not him. But then the twisted animatronics actually aren't defeated and get back up chasing them. Then Charlie and Springtrap fight. Then they pull her off where Charlie screams, WHY DID YOU TAKE HIM AND NOT ME?! To which Springtrap looks to her and proclaims, I didn't take him. I took you. Oh my god. Wait, what? You spent the whole fucking book waiting for this dickhead to show up, and when he finally does, it just leaves you questioning more. But before you can even process that, Charlie thinks that she finds the door her brother is trapped behind, being entranced by it despite the building, again, collapsing. And she finally breaks out of it because John shouts, Charlie! I love you. And after all this, this fucking slog fest, she once again gets captured by Freddy Fazbear, who fucking crushes her to death. Yeah, no really, Charlie dies. After this, John, Jessica, and a fellow student already sit around in shock of Charlie's death, with Marla showing up to console him. And while all seems dim, they look outside and see a familiar face walking towards them. It's Charlie. Only for John to look at her, sit in silence, and finally say, That's not Charlie. Oh my god! And that's how it fucking ends! What an infuriating book. The first seems so quaint in comparison. Even if it had some neat ideas and cool moments, the Twisted Ones more often than not had me in one of two states at any given time. Bored or mad. And this ending left me no different, it genuinely put me in a bad mood for the rest of the day. But despite all this, despite all that bitching, I'm not gonna lie and say that I'm not invested. I really wanna see where the fuck this story goes. Who's this not Charlie? What did Springtrap want with her? What did he mean when he said he took her instead of her brother? Well, unfortunately, there's only one way to find out. It's time for the pulse-pointing conclusion to the best-selling trilogy, Freddy Fazbear, The Fourth Closet. Interesting that it seems like they're jumping right into sister location territory here, with the cover this time featuring Funtime Frederick. Also, can I just say, whoever decided to call the third book in the trilogy the fourth closet, fuck you. I don't know if it's just me, but the book somehow feels cheaper here compared to the other two. Perhaps it's the texture that feels different. Either way, this one came out only a year after the last, which has me a little worried. Was it a rush job wanting to cash in on the hype? Let's press forward. What really happened to Charlie? It's the question that John can't seem to shake, along with the nightmares of Charlie's seeming death and miraculous reappearance. John wants to forget the whole terrifying saga of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, but the past isn't so easily buried. Meanwhile, there's a new animatronic pizzeria opening in Hurricane, along with a new rash of kidnappings that feel all too familiar. Bind together by their childhood loss, John reluctantly teams up with Jessica, Marla, and Carlton to solve the case and find the missing children. Along the way, they'll unravel the twisted mystery of what really happened to Charlie, and the haunting legacy of her father's creations. The story for the fourth closet takes no break, they immediately get into the thick of it. It's been six months since the last book, and John has been traumatized over what happened to Charlie with her dying. I mean, not to say I told you so, John, but... That's what you get for falling in love with a crazy lady. Not only that, but he ends up running into a brand new pizza establishment that opened up in town, along with a new batch of kidnappings to boot. Hmm, I'm sure those couldn't possibly be related, could they? After a bit, John runs into Jessica, and after a bit of small talk delivers the line that fucking hooked me. I miss seeing you around. 
And so does she. Oh fuck, that's right, Charlie supposedly didn't die. This just got interesting. With the book as a whole feeling like one big third act, it's a little hard to analyze bits of the story in a certain order, like the characters writing or whatever, without simply just talking about the reveals and discussing those. Because a majority of this book is exposition and building off of elements set up in the first two. First of all, I'd love to point out how much I love Charlie and John's interactions in this one. What was once my least favorite part of the previous book is now my favorite here. They bring back Marla and Carlton for this one, who along with Jessica are ecstatic to see Charlie wind up alive, clearly being in some kind of denial as John doesn't believe it for a second, being the only one to have watched her die right in front of him. The way they interact with her having some of Charlie's memories but clearly missing a couple details here and there, along with John constantly flip-flopping on whether or not he thinks it's the real her, makes their conversations way more engaging, with him noticing all the little inconsistencies in her appearance or personality, seemingly not caring about any of her dad's creations anymore and wanting to get away from it all, moving out of Jessica's dorm. They do a good job of keeping you questioning if it's really her or not, by switching to her perspective every now and then, questioning why John doesn't believe it's really her, still makes you feel attached to her and not know what to believe. When we aren't looking at this, we're hearing the experiments of an unknown figure, who seems to be working on something big with the assistance of a tall, lanky girl animatronic. Spoiler warning. It's this fuck ugly thing. Things really begin to kick off when John and Jessica find out where Charlie's Aunt Jen is, who seems very unwilling to divulge in any info regarding what's going on. Not before they sneak upstairs in her house and open a large box only to find... The real Charlie! Where the now proven fake Charlie enters the house and proceeds to kill Jen where she stands. From here, the book is non-stop action, where not Charlie starts to catch on to the fact that John and company are aware she's fake, and now has to find the real Charlie at all costs. But just who is this not Charlie? Who sent her? And how did she manage to look so much like the real thing? I think we all know by now that no matter what, the answer has something to do with William Afton, who is, miraculously, still alive, and is experimenting on this big amalgamation of parts with his robot sidekick. I will say that I'm glad that they retroactively went out of their way to backtrack on the way he presented himself in the Twisted Ones, being much more collected here, aware of his mortality, and acknowledging that his newfound life and strength that he gained from being inside Springtrap made him act that way, even scaring Jessica in the fourth closet through an illusion of Springtrap who acts much more like the theatrical version of himself from that book. We see a different side to William here, he's old and decrepit, clearly on his last legs alive, nearing death where he admits that his mortality terrifies him, being afraid of hell. Which, you know, probably isn't helped by all the child murder. From the way he describes it, he fears death more than the excruciating pain he's put through every day. Which is why he's so overjoyed by being in the spring bonnie suit, it was like he had cheated death. Metal is supposedly a strong conductor of this stuff called Remnant, and so his soul had fused with the machine. And since he escaped from the suit, he's once again trying to cheat death, by slowly having his assistant take apart his organs and put them inside of the strange amalgamation which is later revealed to have been the combined remains of the robots from FNAF 1, Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy, with the dead children's souls still being trapped inside. That's already a lot to take in, but I assure you, it gets more complicated. This is all leading up to the astonishing reveal where Charlie is confronted with William Afton's assistant, this sleek figure that looks like Baby but more humanoid, who has not only been using the disc illusion thingies to look more like the cartoony Baby seen in the games, but also like Charlie. You were right, John. That other Charlie was an imposter! Were then met with the bombshell that our Charlie isn't even the real Charlie herself. Our Charlie is nothing more than a ragdoll built by Henry, given memories so that he could cope with the loss of his real daughter who was kidnapped by Springtrap. He surrounded his house with the illusion creating devices and went mad, not being able to discern what's real and what's not. And stricken with grief and shame, Henry built an animatronic with the purpose of killing him, leaving Charlie in the care of Aunt Jen, the only other person who knew the truth behind what Charlie is. A robot. <sighs> I have to say, they present this idea in a way that's, yes, convoluted, <laughs> very convoluted, but somehow works in context of the story. But, but I'm getting too far ahead of myself. The way the book is pieced out means all this shit is revealed in varying orders, but for the sake of simplicity and understanding, I'm gonna start at the beginning and go in order. Okay, so you're gonna wanna sit down for this. Before getting into the story, I first need to explain to you what Remnant is, since I mentioned it earlier. I have to thank my good friend Allison for explaining all this to me. This shit's a nightmare. Remnant is a concept that's teased as far back as the Silver Eyes, with the line, Memories, I, I think they'll linger whether there's someone there or not. 
The house, her old house, was imbued with memory, with loss, with longing. It hung in the air like humidity. The walls were saturated like the wood is soaked in it. It had been there before she came in, and it was there now. It would be there forever. It had to be. There was too much, too great and vast a weight, for Charlie to have brought it with her. Basically, in the FNAF series, a soul is not something you're born with, it's composed of your experiences, your memories and the emotions that come with them. A soul is crafted and built over time as you continue to live life. It's important to know that Charlie, despite being a robot, had a soul and was just as human as the friends surrounding her. She made her own memories and felt real emotion. Got all that? Okay, great. So, William Afton and Henry Emily, nice surname, loser, team up to create Fred Bear's Family Diner, a fun-filled place for kids and adults where they have these innovative spring lock suits on hand. William dons the spring bonnie suit to lure and kidnap Henry's daughter Charlie, killing her. William kills Charlie out of jealousy of what he perceives to be Henry's perfect family. Henry never finds out what his partner had done and quickly goes mad. He moves to a new house in Hurricane, and while not flat out stated anywhere, it's heavily implied that Henry's wife and son Sammy move away from him, as he's apparently been going crazy, surrounding himself with these experimental illusion lights and discs, which only allows him to see what he wants to, blocking out the real world and no longer being able to discern reality from fiction. He tries to fix this by using his deceased daughter's ragdoll toy to build a robot duplicate of her, recording memories and placing them inside of her mind, so that she's none the wiser of what's happened, having closets in a room that contain future older versions of Charlie, presumably to let out when the time comes. One of these Charlie robots is Baby, although Henry had given up on her once he realized what he was doing was fucked up, and so she remained incomplete in his workshop. Sometime around now, Henry and William also open up Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, by the way, with new animatronics taking center stage. William, from his perspective, basically sees Charlie come back from the dead, in the form of this new robotic version of her. He's fascinated by the idea that Henry could give his life to something out of grief for what he had lost. Henry poured his love and anguish and all of his emotions into that doll, which gave it life, at the cost of leaving a part of himself behind. His emotion. William completely misses the point of this. He has no love or grief. All he wants is the possibility of immortality. Finding life in something inanimate, something that's never been seen before. And therefore, in 1985, starts experimenting with the children, murdering five of them, including Charlie's childhood friend Michael, and stuffs them inside the animatronic suits. Which, along with the bad press of children going missing on the premises, causes Freddy to shut down. Henry goes even more mad, and after realizing that he'll never get his real daughter back, and can't move on, builds an animatronic to murder him. He hides the older Robo Charlie in a closet, buries the twisted animatronics, and leaves a note for Aunt Jen, asking her to burn down his house with Robo Charlie in it, so she can never get out. Aunt Jen could never do this though, recognizing the life that Robo Charlie now had. It would be like killing any other human being. Aunt Jen took Charlie away, protecting her from the secret of what she really is. Through killing the kids, William realizes that one spirit follows through flesh, but also the peon. He considers the possessed animatronics his perfect family, a family he always sought after. That's not to mention though that William actually had a family, a daughter named Elizabeth. That's right, purple guy fucked, what's your excuse? William was very much so neglectful and abusive to Elizabeth. She was always living in the shadow of what was to become his greatest creation. See, Henry never turned the fourth Charlie, the oldest one, off, with her remaining incomplete in his office, witnessing everything. With the first words Henry even spoke to her being, you are wrong. Because of this, she grows an immense hatred for him and our Charlie, and so gives herself to William to study. Now with the incomplete adult Charlie robot, William starts to modify it into Baby. And now being jealous of how much attention Baby is getting, Elizabeth sneaks down one night to look at her up close, which results in her being scooped up and killed, her soul now combining with Baby. This is because William was making Baby to lure more kids and kill them so he can further keep on experimenting. Still though, this adult Charlie, Baby, was still incomplete. It wasn't good enough for William. She wasn't as good as our Charlie. She didn't have the same spark of life. Which is because despite being a robot, Charlie still had a soul that was completely her own. One that she had built herself. She could grow, change, and mature like a normal human. And that's what William could never understand. William further wants to control the kids he had killed by becoming one with them. He fuses their souls together in an amalgamation, and is slowly inserting himself inside of it. Extracting remnants from them and putting them inside his new Funtime animatronics, Freddy, Mangle, and Foxy. Once William experiments with this on Carlton, he ends up inserting Carlton's soul, his remnant, into the mess, allowing Carlton to enter this memory world, where he could allow the kids to remember what happened to them. 
that Spring Bonnie, William Afton, is the one that killed them. And now realizing this, the kids were finally able to fight back against him, and once and for all, kill William Afton. This seems like one of those things that only really starts to make sense once you actively sit down and think about it for a while and reread the books. And despite being pretty cool once you put all the pieces together, it results in the book itself feeling a little bloated. There is no breathing room, and there's plenty of points where it drags on for a while. Like when Jessica is running from Mangle and the baby crawlers, there was non-stop action for like 7 pages, and at a certain point I just switched off. Still though, left an impact on me as a whole. I was sad to find out the truth behind Charlie so eh, I clearly grew attached. The book ends with Charlie sacrificing herself, using the same robot her father used to kill himself to destroy Elizabeth slash baby slash herself technically, and as a result of this, kills herself in the process. At the end of one of the previous books, John and Charlie go to visit Sammy's grave, but at some point in the fourth closet, he lets the not Charlie know that he never even really saw the words on there, and so she tells him to go and take a closer look. And the book ends with him doing just that. He takes a look at the grave of Charlie's father, and when he finally does, he sees something he had never noticed before. Charlie's grave. It had been there the whole time, dying when she was three years old. There's apparently some debate in the fan base as to what this ending means. See, John is directed to the grave by the figure of a girl, which leads some to believe that either John possibly killed himself, and the figure is Charlie, welcoming him to the afterlife, or that Charlie managed to survive the stabbing through transferring her soul to the final body. I, I didn't think of any of that, I just sort of took it at face value and thought it was symbolism, you know? Either way, we're done. That's the end of the Five Nights at Freddy's novel trilogy, and boy does that first book seem so simple in retrospect. I was not prepared for how deep this shit was gonna go. But I gotta say, if I take it for what it is and don't question how outlandish some of this stuff can get, I really enjoyed myself here, and was engaged a majority of the time with these characters and their lives. I am glad that they quit here though, and didn't attempt to continue the story any further, instead opting for the next series Fazbear Frights to feature an entirely different set of stories. But that's still not the end of the novel trilogy, however, as in 2019 we got the graphic novel adaptations of all three books. So hey, let's give them a quick glance for fun. I figured for time's sake we'd just combine all three of these into one. At the end of the day, the stories are untouched. Now we just have visuals instead of words. Most likely after Scott realized that in the year of our Lord and Savior, the last way a kid would want to get their FNAF lore is through reading. Throughout 2019 until 2022, we received graphic novel adaptations of all three books in the trilogy. And boy, is there some mixed results. The covers here are all a neat idea, but it brings to attention one of the biggest flaws with these, being that they're all done in entirely different art styles. Silver Eyes being pretty loose and basic, Twisted Ones being very detailed but sketchy, and Fourth Closet having a much more refined style with better shading. Speaking of these covers, did you know that one of the artists behind these books actually attempted to redo that god-awful bonus poster we got at the start of the video? And what do you know, it looks ten times better! I guess this is a sign of things to come. Before we start, I have to make it clear that nothing I'm about to say is a reflection of these artists or their work. I can only assume how tight the deadlines for these were, on top of just how much here there was to adapt. With the first book not even having a sole adapter, instead that job was just given to the illustrator, which I can only imagine increased their workload. I gotta say it was super weird seeing the official designs for these characters after spending so long envisioning them in my head. I pictured Charlie looking like that lady from Joan of Arcadia, given the description of Brian Hare and Ryan Fias. I thought John might look something like... I don't know, Justice Smith. Given her name, I always just imagined Jessica being her character from 13 Reasons Why. And don't ask why, but I always figured Marla looked like that one bitch from High School Musical who was standing dancing on the tables in the cafeteria. There, th that's my head cannon. Instead, there's some weird differences here that took a little getting used to, such as Jessica being a blonde, despite her description claiming she had brown hair. Although that was most likely done so that not all three of our female protagonists would have the same colored hair. William Afton, though, I was not fucking prepared for. He looks so fucking dumb, and not intimidating at all. Although, that may be a direct result of the first book looking so fucking bad. I'm sorry, there's no way around it. The Silver Eyes adaptation is awful. At first, I thought it was simply a directed rip of the novel. Almost everything is word for word, which you'd think would be a good thing, but not at all, as a matter of fact. Not having any descriptions for these locations, not having those beats where we see the characters think to themselves for a bit, allowing us to grow more attached to them is completely removed. It's basically just like we're seeing the first book, but only the text boxes. I got through this thing in like an hour because there's nothing going on. You can really see the artist struggling to rush through and condense this thing. There is no stopping here and it seriously hurts the piercing. 
I wondered how they somehow managed to shrink it from an initial 400 pages to only 200, and then that's when I realized that they actually were taking creative liberties here, but took out some stuff that's integral to later reveals. Removing segments like the friends calling a policeman to Freddy's who drives them back to meet Claire for the first time, I understand. It doesn't add a lot other than showing the adults don't believe them, which is already shown through the later interaction with Claire, fine. But then they remove shit like near the beginning of the book, where John asks about the differing sizes of closets in Charlie's room. Okay, so keep in mind how we later learn that the different robot Charlies are behind these closets. Remember how Charlie spends the entire second book looking for it. Remember how the fucking name of the final book is The Fourth Closet. Now let's see how the novel treats the first mention of this thing, versus the graphic novel. The closets had been built to align with the slant of the ceiling, and there were three of them. Ella lived in the short one, which was about three and a half feet tall. Next to it was one a foot or so taller, and a third, closest to the bedroom door, with the same height as the rest of the room. She smiled, remembering. Why do you have three closets? John had demanded the first time he came over. She looked at him blankly, confused by the question. Because that's how many there are, she said finally. She pointed defensively to the little one. That one's Ella's anyway, she added. John nodded, satisfied. Charlie shook her head and opened the door to the middle closet, or tried to. The knob stopped with a jolt. It was locked. She rattled it a few times but gave up without much conviction. She instead crouched low to the floor and glanced up at the smallest closet, her big girl closet that she would someday grow into. You won't need it until you're bigger, her father would say, but that day never came. I remember showing these closets to John. Why do you have three closets? There's no, there's no more, that's it. They even keep in the same dialogue later, where John refers to it as her big girl closet. That line no longer makes any sense because you cut out the moment where she calls it that. And also, they put next to no emphasis on the closet here, it makes their inclusion later feel way more thrown together. That comparison is the perfect description of the Silver Eyes graphic novel. It's the first book, but sliced in half with genuinely terrible, terrible art. It ruins so many of the best moments here, because whenever I was reading the words, I could at least envision it in my head and picture the best version of what it could look like. Like when William Afton creepily explains to Carlton what will happen if he moves in the Springlock suit. I didn't need to know that he was standing in a brightly lit room smiling and crossing his arms, that ruins it! Again, no shame to the artist, I understand this probably isn't what they're truly capable of, but this does not look official, it seems more like a DeviantArt fan comic. Thankfully, the Twisted Ones and Fourth Closet hired somebody to actually adapt them, meaning actual time was taken to figure out what should be kept or shortened or changed altogether, while still keeping the story intact. I'm really not that into the art style changing so drastically between them, but honestly, I'll take it if it means I don't have to look at any more of this. Already there's a massive improvement with the Twisted Ones. The speech bubbles look formatted better, we actually get to see Charlie's thoughts again, and despite every now and again they rely too much on weird gradient backgrounds, there's way more creative and better looking shots in here. It's not amazing, the sketchy style isn't my favourite to be honest, and it made reading these back to back pretty jarring, but it works better for certain scenes, especially with the twisted animatronics. It allows them to show a lot of detail while still being able to cut some corners. And boy does it feel like corners were cut! For every cool illustration we get, like the reveal of Springtrap, we get shit like Balloon Boy's introduction. Hi. Something definitely different you get from reading these over the novels is that the foreshadowing becomes way more apparent, you know, given we can actually see what the characters are seeing. Which makes it easier to pick up on certain stuff, like a childhood photo of Charlie where she's wearing the exact same outfit as Ella. Or her visions of being trapped in a box making a lot more sense now, knowing that in the fourth closet she quite literally is trapped in that same box. Speaking of, this foreshadowing is only further exemplified with the fourth closet. There was a bunch of neat details here I picked up on that I didn't realize until now, either because I simply missed them, or it could be the fact that this adaptation is a lot more direct with the reveals. They point out the obvious a little more, which is a good thing because I'm a little slow and didn't pick up on some of this stuff before. Around the beginning of the novel, a mysterious woman approaches the junkyard, where she asks the owner to show where he had heard children screaming from a previous night. I'm not sure if they mentioned it in the book when I just missed it, but in the graphic novel, Carlton Flatout says that the FNAF robots were thrown in the junkyard by the police, and now we can visibly see that the lady is Baby. And knowing where all this was gonna go when I read it now, I finally realized that this is where they find the FNAF 1 robots to bring to William so he can fuse with them. Or there's the part where Jessica confronts William and how he survived Charlie activating the spring locks on him in Silver Eyes, with Charlie finding out in the Twisted Ones that fake blood was found on the scene, presumably being William he faked his own death. However, William turns down the claim, letting you know that he bled real blood that day, just like any human. At first I figured this was a forgotten detail, something they were never gonna come back to. 
but most likely to help stupid people like me. The fourth closet adaptation includes a line where Aunt Jen is talking to Henry, saying that just because he can make a doll that bleeds doesn't mean he can bring Charlie back, showing of course that it was her blood they find on the scene that day. There's also minor details I enjoy here that weren't in the original, such as how John actually asks Charlie about Artie, who at the end of the Twisted One said they were dating. If you couldn't tell already, I've got a much more positive opinion on the fourth closet adaptation, not only because of the way they translated it to a graphic novel in regards to writing, but the art too is just a major step up from both of the previous ones. All the characters are defined well, it doesn't feel like it's going off model too much, and there winds up being a ton of really cool looking shots like the final moment where Charlie and Elizabeth get stabbed. I will say though, the way the ending is illustrated here makes me question my initial perspective on what's happening here. In general, the symbolism is much clearer to grasp, like seeing Elizabeth walk up to the robot William is turning into Baby. We can see that it still looks like Charlie, which makes it easier to understand that Baby is a weird combination of all three, but this ending had me fucking stumped. Initially, I figured that John finally witnessed Charlie's tombstone, putting it to rest in his mind that she's died. However, here he's facing away from it. We never actually get a shot of him looking at it and taking it in, before walking away with Charlie, the final shot showing the other side of the tombstone where her real body lies. So, did he find out if Charlie was a robot or not? He was unconscious whenever that reveal was happening, so... Fuck it, I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Send me an email at fnaffreddylover123 at gmail.com, and don't forget to find the answers locked away deep within the subscribe button. Don't forget to give it a click. At the end of the day, I can at least say that I believe the fourth closet graphic novel is a fine substitution for the text novel, where you can get just as much out of reading either. But would I recommend reading the books for the first time before these? Nope. While the last one is good on its own, to get to it you have to go through this thing. With all these different books being illustrated and colored by different folks, tonally all feeling so different, it causes the whole package to not feel cohesive to me. If you want my opinion, you're better off sticking to the novels. And with that, we can finally move on to the next section of the video. As in 2019, Scott released a sub-series of books for the franchise, being Fazbear Frights. An anthology series consisting of three short stories in each, relating to the Freddy's universe, but not being tied down to one core idea. So in total, we're going to be looking at around 36 mini-stories. 37 really, but I'll get into that, don't you worry. Going in, I'm really curious as to how creative Scott was willing to let these writers get with these. I've heard things. I have heard things. And so I'm very curious as to how these things are going to be executed. So let's start with... First of all, can I just say that I hate that the collection containing all these books brings attention to how all these spines don't line up correctly? Come on, it couldn't have been that hard. How am I supposed to set this on a shelf now? It's ruined! Right off the bat, I love the cover here. The imagery of Spring Bonnie hiding underneath a ball pit, seeing nothing but the human eyes staring up at you is genuinely cool imagery. I hope the book manages to live up to it. So here we go. Fazbear Frights. Into the pit. Fazbear Frights. Into the pit. Fazbear Frights, into the pit. Nothing. Table of contents. Fazbear Frights, into the pit. Into the pit. Trees died for this. I'm not sure if it were intentional or not, but each of these three stories here follow along a similar loose theme of wishing for change. The back of the cover brings attention to it, but I'm not sure if that were just realized after the fact and tied together for a neat little blurb, but either way. Our first story sees a young boy named Oswald. He grows up in a very not well-off family, with his only real friend having moved away. Given it's the summertime, his father sends him to spend his days at the library, and he goes to the local pizza store, where there's this mysterious abandoned ball pit, something that was clearly here before the famous Jeff's Pizza. What could it possibly be? What, what could this possibly have been? I appreciate that the first mini-story brings you into some familiar territory, probably to ease in the viewer and get them ready for the more bizarre concepts they get into later. But for what it is, I appreciate that Into the Pit remains a fairly simple idea that isn't expanded on very much. Or at the very least, it doesn't need to waste your time drowning you in endless lore reasons for why this shit starts happening. With Oswald entering the pit, only to realize that when he arises, he finds himself in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza back in 1985. How does this ball pit allow him to time travel? Who cares, it's Five Nights at Freddy's! Due to it being so short, only less than 70 pages, we don't get a ton of time to really grow a connection to our protagonist. I mean, what do we really learn about him? He likes manga? Hey, I think I found out why you have a friend issue, buddy. Speaking of, 
With it not needing to worry itself with fitting into the opening story of the games, it means that it can take place in the current day. Very weird seeing a FNAF book talking about smart tablets and YouTube and CGI discussions, but again, spin-off book, who cares? Things start to escalate once Oswald finds himself in Freddy's the day that the purple guy is caught in the Spring Bonnie suit, with him somehow managing to follow Oswald to the future, where he takes his father down into the pit. The best part of this story has to be the aftermath, where Oswald sees that Spring Bonnie has assumed the role of his father, appearing in his home where his mother doesn't see what's going on, making him feel like he's gone mad. But I don't like how quickly and unceremoniously this ends. He sneaks out of the house, so away from Spring Bonnie, and goes back to Jeff's pizza, where he finds his dad still floating in the pit. And when the rabbit comes to kill Oswald, he literally just fucking kills himself by getting tangled on some netting and hanging himself by accident. Yep. William Afton versus a seven-year-old, and a piece of rope somehow wins. Still though, his dad then wakes up and they walk home, the purple guy never returning again. Or does he? Well, he doesn't. Into the Pit is fine. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. I think it mostly does a good job at giving you an idea of what to expect with these stories. Speaking of... Our next story is titled To Be Beautiful, and features a girl named Sarah who isn't happy with her appearance, being jealous of the popular girls in her school for looking so pretty while she has a potato nose. <laughs> One day she walks by a junkyard, and winds up rescuing this strange humanoid robot named Eleanor, who in return for Sarah saving her is willing to grant a wish for her, with of course her wish being to look like the other girls. I like this one much more, thankfully, although it isn't safe from some issues. From here, they mostly just repeat the same kind of gimmick over and over. Eleanor gives her a necklace that every day will make her more and more pretty, but is sure to warn her to never take it off, although it doesn't really give her a reason as to why. This is followed by us seeing Sarah's day by day, seeing how much more popular she's become now that she doesn't look like a freak! Free! While I get what they're going for, I think the message is a little too on the nose, with her eventually having the necklace fall off in front of everyone, and is exposed for no longer being human, her legs being nothing more than robotic gears and wires. This is then met with the reveal that Eleanor each night has been removing Sarah's unfavorable parts, and replacing them with perfect robotic ones, with her ultimate plan being to use her body parts to give herself life, running away and taking on the role of Sarah, with the real Sarah turning into nothing more than trash. Again, a little obvious, don't you think? Of course, a big issue here is, if I was Eleanor and secretly wanted her to take off the necklace, why would I make such a big deal in warning her not to? I would just tell her to put it on for a week and then take it off, how the fuck would she know what would happen? But this is of course some big commentary on unfair beauty standards. You know, it's not what's on the outside that matters, it's what's on the inside. Despite Sarah having an artificial appearance of beauty on the outside, on the inside, she's nothing more than a heap of trash. I think that commentary aspect of it maybe overtook the scares a bit. I mean, this whole reveal and ending only happens in the span of like three pages. I think maybe we could have treated for a more impactful ending in exchange for one of the many, many scenes of her at school relishing in her new life. I will say though, I'm surprised that they ended it with her dying. No real fanfare or anything. In that regard, I think the lack of impact is neat. Simply ending on the line, she felt sadness, and then she felt scared, and then she felt nothing at all. Saying all that, I'd probably still put it above Into the Pit, didn't take as long to get into the plot, or as Into the Pit spent a lot of the beginning establishing the state of Oswald's family. So let's see if they manage to top themselves with this final entry. Count the Wes has us follow Millie. She's goth. They really want you to know she's goth. Her wish is that she wants to disappear, and from the very first paragraph it seems that she's about to get that wish. This all changes when she meets a new kid in her class, Dylan, who seems to have the very same interests as her, which gives her a brand new outlook on life. They spend a lot of time together, he gets her gifts, getting to a point where she thinks they're becoming boyfriend and girlfriend. This all comes to ruin, however, when she finds out the awful truth that she wasn't that important to him as he was to her, seeing her as nothing more than a friend, and in fact, having a girlfriend himself. Damn, what a chad. I like that he scolds her for this too. She blows up at him for dating a blonde bitch, to where he flat out calls her a hypocrite for judging others before knowing them when she's expressed that she doesn't like others doing that towards her. This eventually causes her demise though, as it puts her back in the brooding mood, and on Christmas while all her family are having fun together, she sneaks off into her grandfather's workshop, hiding away inside a familiar white and pink bear suit. Is that meant to be me? Yeah, that's true. Really? Mm hmm. Okay, look, look, that's it. Get out. Hmm? That's it. Get out. Oh. Okay. <sighs> this is when we get the reveal of the voice talking to Emily throughout the book, 
naming all the gruesome ways in which she can die, taking great pleasure in the idea of such, was him giving her the options of how he's gonna do it. He even calls her out too. Everyone gangs up on her. He's like, I thought you wanted this, I thought you always said you wanted to die. To where she pussies out saying that she never would have actually done it. Nothing matters because we're all gonna die someday! <laughs> no, 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 please don't kill me, please no, 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 I don't wanna die! How is Fun Time Freddy still haunted Night for Blood? Who cares, it's a spin-off. I enjoy seeing these characters put in new, unrelated settings like this, not bound to pre-existing rules. He's fucking cool here as well. She tries to bargain with him to save her life, and he's just like, I like to kill people, and you'd like to die. He's ruthless here. The writing still isn't the best. Like To Be Beautiful, their message is very on the nose. It's a pretty basic, not taking things for granted story, with Millie in the last few pages showing such remorse for the way she had treated everyone, wishing for her parents to come back so she can tell them how much she loves them. But fucking dead. The ending is very well done. I love that it describes her family in the other room celebrating Christmas, not wanting to disturb her in her brooding, and saying that she can open her presents when she gets back, not realizing that she was just murdered in the other room. Reminds me a lot of the Billy and Mandy episode that scared the shit out of me whenever I first saw it as a kid. Overall, this was a very interesting start to the Fazbear Fright Saga. I wouldn't say any of these stories are groundbreaking or had me on the edge of my seat, but I think they set the foundation pretty well for what's to come, and I can only hope that it's executed to the best of its ability in the next ones. Okay, so as I mentioned way earlier, each of these books ends with a short few pages going over one long interconnecting story, most likely to somewhat try and tie together some kind of lore for them that makes sense. Also, it encourages you to buy all the books, is that too? Initially, I was just gonna wait and combine them all at the very end to get the full picture, but of course, it couldn't be that simple. Apparently, some of these epilogues give context for shit happening in future books, so I gotta cover it piece by piece and put it together at the end. Perfect. In the first one, we get details of a detective named Larson, catching up on some reports since his wife had filed for divorce and he's nothing better to do, lamenting about how he's been such an absentee father for their son Ryan, focusing too much on his work. We hear about this supposed urgent legend called the Stitch Ref, with Larson being assigned to the case after something in the news has called its reputation as fiction into question. The disappearance of a girl named Sarah. Oh, okay, I see why I had to read these now. There's a strange cloaked figure roaming the streets, having an obsession with trash and dumpsters, with five bodies recently turning up all with blood streaming from their eyes like a bad creepypasta. The segment ends with him seeing security cameras describing the figure, not looking human with a white face and black marks on it, like a child had drawn them on, pulling out what appears to be a mannequin from a dumpster, and it turns out they've got a match. And you're not gonna believe where we got it from. In conclusion, I don't know what this is alluding to. They're clearly keeping it as vague as possible so you'll keep reading, but tied it to the Sarah story to pique your interest. So with that, it's time to move on to the next set of stories to see where this is taking us. The cover for Fetch is neat, but it's probably one of the more generic ones in the bunch, featuring a close-up shot of this brown dog animatronic. I don't think his design is all that interesting, aside from the gaping holes where his pupils should be, but composition-wise, it's a little too similar to Into the Pit for my taste, just without the better colors and creepier scene it sets up. It's the sort of book that keeps going missing when I set it somewhere because the colors blend together so much. Much like the last one, Fazbear Frights 2 follows a theme between all its stories, being the concept of all of our characters wanting some sort of control over their life. Although, unlike the previous, I'm glad to see it's done in some varied ways here. Our first story, Fetch, features Greg and his two best friends checking out an abandoned pizzeria, which we later learn is one of the Freddy's chains, which was closed down due to what happened at the mean one. They even run into the original animatronics at one point. While they're there, they find this small little dog animatronic called Fetch, whose whole thing was that he would link up to your smartphone to assist you with shit. Why would a robot from the 80s be designed to do this? Spooky! This one was much worse in terms of the ways the kids all speak to each other. Apparently, to them, this smartphone linking feature is lit. And Greg's crush at one point exclaims, That's Gucci! But despite all that, I was shocked to see that I actually ended up enjoying this one a ton. It's probably because it's much less cut and dry. All of these stories have around 16 more pages compared to the last, and because of that, there's a little more room to expand. For example, in class, Greg is learning about zero point fields which is the idea that no matter what, you'll never be able to empty a room of all its matter. It's the lowest energy state. Greg is very interested in this topic, and even attempts to try this study by a guy called Cleve Baxter, which theorizes that plants are able to react in a way that suggests they read our thoughts. They're not even very subtle about the fact that it's very coincidental that he's learning about these things considering what's happening to him in real life. Greg mysteriously starts receiving texts from Fetch, who's really fucking funny, by the way, messaging him shit like, don't do anything stupid. 
Why would I do anything stupid? Don't know. I don't know why, but the idea of a dog saying that is so fucking funny to me. Anyways, despite initially being seen as helpful to Greg, like helping him with his Spanish homework and such, he starts to suspect that maybe Fetch has tapped into more than simply just his phone, being able to order stuff on his mother's shopping list, and even responding to Greg acknowledging stuff he talked about to a friend on the phone. And this is when he learns that he really needs to be careful about what he says. Don't do anything stupid. Greg expresses hatred for the neighbor's dog. Dog shows up dead in his garden. He asks for his Uncle Dave's help on something using a freeze that only makes sense to the two of them. Uncle Dave's severed finger winds up in his dresser. The dog thinks that he has to go and retrieve his crush. Uh-oh. I think what I like most about Fetch is that there are clear rules established. An issue with a lot of modern horror is that there aren't really any rules set for the evil. It can just do anything. Its only goal is to cause pain and suffering to the world. But with Fetch, he's not a mindless killing machine. He'll only do what Greg tells him to, and takes everything literally. He wasn't ready for that kind of power, which fits super well to the conversation he had with Kimberly earlier in the story. As when he tries to tell her about his experiment, she points out that you're gonna crash and burn before you ever figure it out. Which rings in his head over and over again as he later walks outside his bathroom and finds the bloody corpse of Kimberly laying there. I like that it ends here. Doesn't overstay its welcome. Even though the idea might just be the furthest thing away from Five Nights at Freddy's, Fetch might be my favorite story so far. Explores a creepy idea to the fullest of its ability, and leaves it at that before going overboard. If this is a sign of things to come, I think we're in for a treat. Get it? Tr treat like... Like a, like a dog tree? Just go to the next one. Our next story is named Lonely Freddy, and tells us the cautionary tale of a boy named Alec, who is a BIG BIG BULLY! He's made out to be this problem child who has no friends, with his parents reading book after book trying to figure out how to make sure he doesn't grow up to be a serial killer. What isn't helping this situation is his little sister, Hazel, who he perceives to be a golden child, who gets whatever she wants. He's incredibly jealous for her and hates her with every fiber of his being. But surprisingly, she wants to help him. She and him come up with a plan for her to act more bad, and him to act more good to balance things out, and have her parents see them more equally. Although Alex doesn't buy this for a second, and thinks that his sister is trying to play chess while he plays checkers, using reverse psychology to make him act more good. And so as a response, he's going to be secretly playing 4D chess, and plans to make a fool out of her in front of everyone at her upcoming party. Honestly, this one has fucking nothing to do with Freddy's. It's all leading up to her birthday party there, but it's completely interchangeable. We learn that Alec always wanted to have a party at Freddy's, but never had enough friends to justify it, with Freddy's even having these little two-feet-tall Freddy Fazbear's called Lonely Freddy's, who are there to interact with and give friendless losers someone to hang out with. Alec's biggest one, though, is the elusive Yarg Foxy. It's a Foxy plush. And unfortunately, his sister has a chance to win it at her party. But he knows that once that doesn't happen and she doesn't get it, she's gonna blow up and be revealed as a giant spoiled brat in front of everyone. This was a pretty good psychology story. The second they introduced the Lonely Freddy concept, you know exactly where it's gonna go, Alec being so ungrateful that he turns into one. But how they get to that point is what I wanted to know. And so on her party day, she does the game to try and win the Yard Foxy. And surprisingly, ends up winning it. But this isn't nearly as heartbreaking to Alec as what happens next when it turns out his sister was playing 5D chess the whole time, and reveals to everyone that she only wanted to win the Arg Foxy so she could give it to her big brother, which sends him into a fury. I feel like a uh, uh, big jerk. He rages and screams, yelling at everyone about how much of a spoiled bitch his sister is. Damn, look at you, Alec. You who once stood so proud, degraded to this crying in a Freddy Fazbear's. What a baby. At this point, he whines and runs backstage, whinging and crying about how much he hates his sister, but he soon notices in front of him is a lone, lonely Freddy. And after being entranced to sit down, he finds he can't move or speak. And when he runs back to the main hall, he sees himself, happy with his family. He and the Freddy have swapped places. And after being fucking vomited over, he's thrown in the dumpster, among an army of other Freddies helplessly screaming out. I like this ending. It's freaky. Although it really makes it apparent that these books are nothing more than the current day equivalent of Goosebumps, or this show I used to watch as a kid called Grizzly Teals for Gruesome Kids. You know, bad kids getting some kind of payback for being so bad. No matter how much I enjoy the ending, however, it doesn't make up for how boring the start of the book is. I get it's to play along with the idea of Alex slowly letting his guard down and growing a bond with his sister, but I don't really care if they like each other or not. They're willing to let their parents argue and laugh about it. I think they're both assholes. Not to mention my favorite part, again, the ending, was already sort of done in the last book with Sarah turning to trash, so it's not like I get anything new out of it. Lonely Freddy was decent. Nowhere near as good as Fetch, but there were some alright ideas in here. 
I just maybe wish it got to the meat a little bit faster. Or at least PSR at the horror elements a little more instead of cramming it all into the final couple pages. Our last story is Eye of Stock, and features a kid named Oscar who feels like he never gets anything he wants. But today that'll change, with him wanting the hot new toy in the market, a plush trap chaser. I have no idea what the continuity is here anymore. Is this based off the in-universe games like in Help Wanted or... I don't know. When it appears it's out of stock, he's not gonna take no for an answer, and steals one that was returned in the back, ignoring the staff's warning that it's defective, with it appearing to have realistic human eyes and teeth. More than any other one, this seriously feels like a creepypasta. Three kids alone at home with the power out, with nothing more than a haunted plush trap in the room with them, and when they want to go back and return it, the story has mysteriously disappeared. Spooky. There's no kind of complexity with this little guy other than wanting to kill. It's shit like that which made Fetch stand out to me. When your antagonist is just a mindless killing machine and that's that, then I find it hard to care that much. Although I guess it does add to the hopelessness. But then I have to wonder why their first response wasn't just a run outside. I like that they adapt aspects of the FNAF 4 minigame here though, with it freezing in the light and them having to use a torch to stop him. If you remember, that's what you had to do in the game to win the event. Also, the parents' dilemmas are getting a little steel at this point. Does every kid really need to have some conflict with their parents? With the big issue here being that since his dad died, Oscar feels his mom has been relying on him too much, not allowing him to be a kid very much. And it is sad when he calls her, and not only admits that he stole from a store, but also yells at her about his dad dying, saying he's not him. But it is a little weird what led to this, was his mom suggesting that he might be a little too old for Halloween. I was sure this was building up to Oscar being killed by Plus Trap, ending his life in regret as that was the last thing he said to his mother. And at first that seemed like what they were going for, as they lead him up to the nearby train tracks, and for some reason he just stands on the tracks to lure it. I'm sure you just could have taken a step back. But either way, Oscar gets hit by the train, killing him in plush trap. Except no, fucking somehow he wakes up, still on the tracks with his friends there, doesn't go to the hospital or anything, he takes it like a champ, damn. The story ends on a good note with him and his mum reconciling. What a Liam story. Overall, I have a much more strong opinion on Fetch over into the pit, but the Fetch story itself is doing most of the heavy lifting there. In the first book, despite clearly having a favourite and most hated, they were all on a pretty similar level of quality. None of them were that much better or worse than the others. But here they start incredibly strong and get progressively worse over the rest of the book with Lonely Freddy being fine but not really feeling like it fits among the rest of them, and Out of Stock just being nothing. Dillo, I'd take one great story over none. And finally we end on Not Detective Larson. Instead we see a new character, Grimm, who's given up and just wants to go about the rest of his life unseen. He watches as a cloaked figure picks up parts on a railroad track. Oh, I, I wonder what that could be. It couldn't possibly relate to the previous story with... Railroad tracks? We then go back to Larson, who enters a young woman's house for an investigation, and finds a cabinet filled with black scribbles and drawings. He looks at the woman Margie and asks, What happened in this house? Alright, not that much to take away. But they're making it clear that something is roaming around and collecting pieces of the stories. For what? Who knows? All I know is we gotta move on to the next book. You like that segue? I'm running out of them. 1.35 AM. Alright, couldn't be any more vague with a title like that, could we? I guess that's the issue in titling each book with the first story, it kind of lessens the other two in your mind. Which I guess is sort of why they'd put their best foot forward with them. This is the first time the cover is focused on something not animal-like. Sure, we had Baby in the graphic novels, but the focal point here is instead on some weird doll with time to wake up in one of its gaping eyes. These teals will keep even the bravest Five Nights at Freddy's players up at night. It's true. It caught my eye that the blurb here claims that apparently each story has a drawn cover done by fan-favorite artist Lady Fizzy, who after a bit of research I find out was anything but fan-favorite. But that's not my drama to discuss, I don't care enough, also it's kinda, kinda creepy. I just wanna see where these covers are, cause all I see is texts reading out the title of the book. Oh, apparently they were finished but cut from the books. Well, you know, that's okay, it just means we can look up the original. Our first story is the titular 1.35 AM, starring Delilah, our first protagonist to not be a child or teenager, instead being this 23-year-old working at a diner, recently divorced from her ex-husband Richard. Fuck you, Richard. Fuck you! Delilah is checked out of life. She believes that she has an obsessive personality, and right now her obsession is that life sucks. 
Got a real millennial mindset. Can I get a hashtag relatable in the chat? Staying true to every creepypasta ever, she goes to a garage seal and finds this broken doll made by Fazbear Energy and Mint. Holy shit, I know what that is! She buys it to help her wake up for her job as she's on thin ice with her boss, setting an alarm on the clock it apparently has for 1.35pm. But oh no, even after throwing it away, she's consistently woken at 1.35 AM, going mad as she believes somebody's out to get her. It was a fine enough starting point for a story, but they don't go anywhere with this. It's clear the goal of this one was to be less overtly scary, like, ooh, blood, and aim to be much more psychological with it. But I don't know, I don't think they go far enough with that aspect to justify how downplayed the scares are. Things get worse and worse every night, thinking somebody is outside, then in her house, under her bed, then touching her, and when she tries to be around other people around that time, it's made clear that nobody else can hear the signs of the doll. Even blowing up at her best friend Harper, accusing her of doing it, the doll is clearly tormenting her. I was fairly intrigued as to where they were going to go with this. She gets in her car and goes near a bridge which led me to believe she was going to try and take her own life to make that endless suffering stop. But instead, she makes the bizarre choice of action to run away from society and crawl deep within a vent, making sure she can't easily get out and that nothing else can come in. The end. Boo. It's just a nothing ending. Why can't the doll get in the vent? If it's made clear that this doll has a supernatural element to it and can traverse wherever Delilah goes to, then why would a measly vent do anything? Is it coated with anti Freddy Fazbear repellent? The doll also doesn't do anything bad here. It just wakes her up and creeps her out at one in the morning. At that point, I'd either just put up with it for the rest of my life or kill myself, simple as. I can appreciate what they were trying to do here, have a more psychological horror, but 1.35am really doesn't do it for me. It didn't help this has been the longest story yet at 90 pages. I guess to contrast that, Room for One More, our next story, is the shortest yet, only being around 65 pages. Sadly, though, I don't really have much to say here. Not because it's bad or anything, but because I could predict the ending from only a few pages in. Stanley has recently been dumped by his girlfriend. He's starting to let his life go. Which doesn't help that he has a security job at a factory, despite never seeing anybody there. His only instruction is to not let anything out. Huh, that's strange. Aren't security guards meant to stop stuff from coming in? On the job, he consistently has nightmares. Something about seeing a street called Fazbear Avenue, then some about Funtime Freddy. But consistently on each day, a tiny ballerina robot sits on his desk, asking for him to take them home. The sister location comparisons were rampant. If you know anything about the mini arenas in that game, you know where this is going. Each time he wakes up from a dream, the robot is missing, appearing again the next night only to do the same thing again. Huh, strange. It's almost like there's more than one of them. They're secretly crawling inside his body at night so he can take them home. I was right in my assumption. The most interesting part of this one was seeing how Stanley's body slowly gets worse over the course of the story, his face becoming more grey, his body begins expanding. All of this of course doesn't help in eating you to predict the ending, but at the same time I enjoyed it. It was like seeing a different take on the secret Michael Afton endings to that game where we see him walk down the street every morning slowly getting more and more fucked up, and everybody thinking he's a freak. Except instead of the son of the purple guy, it's a chubby incel. Altogether though, the way I describe Room for One More is short and sweet. It knows it doesn't have the most deep concept out there, so it doesn't waste your time repeating the same ideas again and again, just slightly different. Sorry, but because of that, I don't really want to waste your time either over explaining it. He says in the two hour long YouTube video. It is what it is and what it is might just be my second favorite story in the whole saga so far, just under fetch. Lastly, we have the new kid, which shows a kid named Devin. Let's go through the checklist real quick. Poor? Yep. Absentee parent? Naturally. Absolute prick? Of course. Devin might just be my least favorite protagonist so far in one of these. I think he's implied to be autistic in some ways, so I can't really blame him, but I get secondhand embarrassment from the way he talks to others and presents himself. For example, he really wants to get the attention of his big crush Heather, and so he gets up in front of the whole class and reads them a story about her two little sisters being murdered because he heard her complaining about them. Then when she calls him sick, he thinks it's in a good way, like, oh, it's fucking sick, bro. That fucking stupid ass modern kid dialogue is at its very worst here. I don't know any sort of kid who talks like Devin or his best friend Mick, saying shit like, this is awesome sauce, and if so, that would be coolio. R.I.P. Devin's ineptitude with talking to others is further highlighted through the main conflict in the story, being that a new kid, Kesley, has just moved into their school and within days has become best friends with pretty much everyone. Even Heather, oh no! It's really strange because I couldn't tell at all where this one was going, and not in a good, unpredictable way, but in the way of, things are just happening and I don't know what the theme is. 
I don't even know whose perspective the story is being told from, or if it's the writer saying these things. That Coolio line wasn't even said by a character, it was said by the writer. There are parts where they'll make a basketball analogy and then go, Whoa, did I just make that analogy? I don't even play basketball. And it just confuses me because I don't know what it's in there for. For, for comedy, maybe? After a whole bunch of nothing happens the entire time, Devin takes Mick and Kessley out into the woods as he's finding new club heights for them all. A seemingly abandoned pizzeria called... Hmm... F... A... Z... The sign is destroyed, I guess we'll never figure it out. They make it clear that Devin has some sort of goal in mind when coming here, having something planned for Kessley. And once they find a familiar golden bear suit, it's fairly obvious where this is going. Kessley accidentally gets killed after the spring locks activate. They run and try to keep it a secret, but when Mick forces Devin to go back and make sure he's dead, he ends up getting trapped in the suit himself and is killed. Kessley nowhere in sight. He sees something inside the suit though. Someone with black, curly hair. Initially, I thought this was Michael from the novels, but that description doesn't fit him. There's a short epilogue showing a completely different school, where Kessley is shown to be trying to incite the exact same situation like he knew the whole time how it would have played out. Why was Kessley doing this? How did he manage to escape the suit? How did he know that things would play out in the exact way he had planned? And I think it's supposed to be scary that we don't know, but it drops the ball at that. It fucking face plants. There seems to be this running theme throughout, this idea of justice. They do their favorite thing ever, apparently, and have this be the very discussion they're having in class around the time. Where when asked about what happens when you try and incite justice and end up causing an accident, Heather simply says, Accidents can happen. I get what they're going for, but why is she saying this? It doesn't even work in context to the story. Like, sure, an accident happened when Devin supposedly killed Kessley. You know, he didn't know the locks would feel, he just wanted to spook him. But he wasn't doing that out of any semblance of justice, it was out of the idea of jealousy. And when Kessley Uno reverse cards it and kills Devin, it wasn't an accident. It was, in fact, very calculated. So this deeper meaning they try to attach onto it completely feels. The new kid is my least favorite of any of these stories hand darn. The idea of a prank going wrong is fine, but the villain sucks and has no motivation. And the deeper meaning doesn't apply. Hated it. Fazbear Frights 3 is definitely my least favorite book in the saga so far. Only one of the stories I enjoyed, and even then I enjoyed it mostly because it didn't overstay its welcome. But even then, that overall gives the book a very uneven feeling. You start with a 90 page story, then a 60 page one, and then back to 90. I much prefer the other's approach of three decently sized adventures. To end with the short mystery going on, we follow a story featuring a man named Dr. Phineas, talking about EDA levels, some shit about being able to protect yourself from negative emotions by manifesting a shield. And as he studies the paranormal, he has a room full of items that he believes are energized by agony. Sounds kind of like the whole remnant thing from the initial novel trilogy. Funnily enough, in The Silver Eyes, when they describe lingering memories, they say, the walls were saturated, like the wood had soaked it in. And when discussing his hypothesis, he claims that you can take a saturation of energy, later saying he just needed to give it a bit more presence so it could properly express the agony it had soaked in from the other items. It's clear here that even if they take place in separate universes, the world here operates on the same rules as the original trilogy. Phineas receives a new shipment of these items, some being party plates and an endoskeleton, which he puts a white clownish mask on, I think we all know where those came from. There's even an animatronic dog that's apparently responsible for some great agony. I can see how all these books are starting to tie together. When someone goes to check on Phineas, he's dead. His gaping mouth open and eyes gone. Amongst all this, the Stitchrith dons a dark cloak and moves on. This is apparently a prequel to the whole story with Detective Larson, showing where the Stitchrith came from. So we learn a lot here, but nothing from before is continued. Things are definitely beginning to pick up here, and I'm starting to become interested as to where it's all headed. Especially how they're going to integrate Remnant back into this summer. Now then, let's get started on book number four. Okay, so I've been trying to work on this video throughout the month of October, and because of that tight schedule, I've had to start reading like two of these Fazbear Fry books a day, and at this point, it's beginning to consume so much of my time that I'm dreaming about my own Fazbear Fright stories. This is becoming a problem. The only thing worse was when for like a week straight last year, I was consistently having FNAF-related dreams where I was trapped in a saw-like setting with each room and trap revolving around one of the animatronics. I... I need to stop doing this to myself. The cover for this one might just be my favorite so far, featuring Foxy hidden behind his iconic staged curtain, prominently showing us his glowing yellow eye and hook. I don't know, it paired along with the fitting title of Step Closer makes it stand out a bunch. These three stories have a theme of isolation, and how it can create a void in oneself. Let's see if they do anything interesting with it. 
Our first is Step Closer, and it opens in a very similar way to the Silver Eyes, actually, recounting a climatic moment later in the book where Foxy is sticking a hook into our protagonist's eye and gouging it out. I thought opening it like this would have some kind of point later on, but when we get there, it's literally a nightmare sequence. I don't understand why someone felt it necessary to begin the book with that, other than for spooky sake, I guess. Ever since Pete's dad left, his mother has been putting him in charge more and more of his little brother Chuck, babysitting him at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Where's the room for him to be a kid and socialize, when he's been given responsibilities he didn't ask for? Well today, he's gonna get back at him with a little prank involving Foxy. When Pete takes Chuck to the maintenance room where Foxy's out of order, things go horribly wrong. When his hook snatches Pete's shirt, and his music box getting stuck on a line about needing to lose an arm and an eye. And ever since then, it seems like karma's starting to rear its ugly head. Most of the story involves Pete trying to go about his day by day while freak accidents happen that are most definitely aiming to do what Foxy is saying. A scalpel nearly cuts his eye out, a butcher's knife nearly chops his arm off, and things seem to only be getting worse and worse. When a fishing hook cuts close to his eye and a saw blade on a construction site cuts his arm. They do a good job at building Pete's paranoia, with him not wanting to believe this is the case before having to unfortunately face the fact that everything is happening for a reason. I like his relationship with Chuck, too. It's actually the first in one of these stories that actually managed to come off as genuine, with them arguing a lot but clearly still having a bond, showing that his disdain for him is less about Chuck himself and more the fact that his parents expect him to take responsibility for him. His dad, too, I like the talk they had on the fishing trip, you know, before all the jabby eye stuff. The finale is built up to very well, too, with the school conveniently having a pirate carnival there, because of course they would, where Pete acts like a freaky psycho and yells at everyone, realizing that he has to go back and beg Foxy for forgiveness, leaving his brother a voicemail to meet him at Freddy's, and in all this hullabaloo he runs out onto the street and gets hit by a fucking truck. He dies. Also, him dying apparently brings his parents back together again, so fuck you, Pete, I guess. Fuck you! The story doesn't end there, though, as earlier on, it's mentioned that his mother is signing him up to be an organ donor. And so, like his oracle says, Pete wakes up in the hospital. He's still dead, but he can still hear, see, and feel. And when the doctors are let known that somebody needs a new arm and eye stat, he has to sit and experience them ripping apart his body. With Chuck going back to face Foxy, where nothing happens. I like this one a lot. Solid story with a setup and payoff. Although, maybe Pete could have done something worse to justify literally being killed, I don't know. He was just kind of being a dickish older brother, that was all. You know, fucking sue him. These books, though, are hopefully starting to pick back up. Our next is the new contender for shortest yet, at a measly 54 pages. But coincidentally, just like the previous short one, I think the simplicity works in its favor. Dance With Me sees Casey and her friend Jack going into Circus Baby's Pizza World. I mean, it's at least a change from Freddy's. And after a bit of looking around, she walks up to a mother, and then grabs her purse and sprints out. Oh, they're, they're thieves. This is just gotten a lot more interesting. After being kicked out from her mother's house at 16, she now lives with Jack in an abandoned warehouse, along with her other friend, Edja, all pickpocketing people and splitting the profits. However, in one of the party bags she stole from a little girl at Circus Babies, she comes across a strange pair of glasses that, when put on, reveals Ballora standing in the distance dancing. Although, funnily enough, her friends don't see it at all. Strange. I really like Dance With Me, more than the last, which I already enjoyed quite a bit. I think it's mostly because it doesn't try to complicate what is such a simple idea. It once again tries to be more psychological, but except doesn't feel the need to tie into some real-world event, it's clearly all in Casey's head. What happens is, each time she puts on the glasses, Ballora is a little bit closer. No matter what, she never goes away. And as you read on, you realize that Ballora is a metaphor for her life of crime, all of its present and following her, even if she isn't directly doing it at that point. There's two points where she decides to skip time, go someplace else and start over. And every time when things seem to be looking up, she tries to justify falling back into bad habits, stealing her co-worker's tips and trying to steal a dress at a store. The last one she gets caught for, and when she gets to the door she can sense Ballora right outside, in front of her. Which is when she realizes that if she runs out she'll be in her arms, like it'll cement to her that there's no more running away from her problem, she'll be nothing more than a thief for the rest of her life. This is sort of shoved down your throat with her dream, where Ballora straight up calls her a thief and a liar. And also when she goes to the bus stop and a nice old lady tells her that her problems are going to follow her unless she faces them. But even still, it's not a huge deal. I understand these books are for little babas who need this stuff spelled out to them. I could not have predicted the ending, however. Where Casey faces what she did, goes back to the house of the lady at Circus Baby she stole from, and returns her purse. Admitting to what she did, and while this lady is honestly way too nice for somebody who, again, stole from her in front of her kids, literally welcomes her into her home for tea. But I still liked it. She gives back the glasses to the little girl, and so she'll never have to see Ballora looming around her ever again. Wasn't expecting a happy ending, but I'm glad we got one. 
Dance With Me is one of the strongest. Hope the winning streak we've got here continues with our final story, Coming Home. Susie has a bad relationship with her sister and mother. They both seem to be very dying lately, barely even acknowledging her existence. Something feels wrong. Not to mention that each and every night, she hears creaking outside, where Chica is revealed, grabbing her hand and walking her away- oh, she's dead. Yeah, they, uh, they don't do a very good job at hiding that. I'm at the very least glad this isn't some reveal to see for the end. Don't really need a FNAF version of Sixth Sense. Although, it would be interesting to see if someday they completely run of ideas for these anthologies, and just start doing movie parodies or folklore adaptations with FNAF characters. You know, like the Simpsons or Family Guy. Yeah, but no, once you start to expect this twist, they drop the act and have the characters openly talk about it, with Susie's sister Samantha realizing that her ghost is lingering around her, as she has unfinished business. Later revealed to her that she never found out the shirt doll that hid somewhere in the house but never showed Samantha where. Okay, so you know how I just used the word she a couple times? And you weren't like, wait a minute, who is this she? I'm confused. You used this little thing called common sense. Well, whoever wrote this story clearly didn't think the reader was capable of this, because they straight up just said both of their names consistently. They have such a restraint against pronouns. In one of the first pages of the story, they say the name Susie 13 times. On one page. Sorry, just had to get that off my chest. I was going crazy reading this. I do think it's a cool idea to base a story around one of the original kids that William Afton killed and stuffed inside a suit. For years, these kids have been nothing more than part of a kill count, so it's clever to actually show us into the lives of one of them, seeing how their family managed to cope with what happened, or in this case, feel to cope. Sort of falls apart by the end, though. Samantha realizes where the doll is, but has to get to it without Chica getting her. Yeah, Chica is just real here, and in her house, she wasn't a metaphor or anything. Not a fan of that, seen mostly for the sake of an action-packed conclusion. Also didn't like how once she got the doll, the ghost of Susie came back to talk to her, with the promise of showing up to their family again in the future as a happy ghost. A theme of moving on would have been preferred in my mind, but whatever, Casper's here, hooray. Altogether though, coming home is an alright idea. Wouldn't mind seeing more of the kids' families be explored here. Expands the universe a bit more, which is very needed as these books are becoming very repetitive. There's a, clearly a formula I'm starting to realize. Book 4? Probably the most solid one, yeah. There were stories I preferred from the other books, but as a package overall, this one has consistent good ones. Happy to see the quality improve. Finally, once again, our epilogue shows someone named Jake, recollecting on his past life, and how it compares to having come back as this metal thing, being in what appears to be a garbage truck with another kid, Andrew. Andrew clearly has a lot of anger built up, expressing how he wanted somebody to hurt. Doesn't know who, though. All they can assume is that he was inside an animatronic dog, Fetch. He even says that he remembers being inside someone who hurt him, not wanting to let him die so he could allow him to suffer, but we never learn what that is. They end up killing the trash man just by trying to touch him, like they sucked his soul out, just like what happened to Finney's from before, which Andrew claims is probably from him. He wanted to do it. Jake then sets out to find everything Andrew has infected with his hate, wanting to right this wrong. Okay, so what I interpret from this is that it's all coming from the Stitch Riff. That's why they were after the Sarah Trash and the Plus Trap Chaser. They're trying to find all the items with this strange energy Phineas was talking about. And so with that, I guess we gotta see if I'm right in that assumption. Probably. Bunny Call is a very cool cover. I, I love the colors especially, with the orange rabbit and hint of blue lighting. Although I think it's funny that the theme for this one is something as serious as Rage Festering with Left in Darkness, paired with such a silly image. I'm glad to see that eco-friendly Scott has emerged, though, with them removing a whole two pages from the start. Now the table of contents is on the left page. But I got used to the old way, and now I don't want change. Bunny calls another unique story in that it stars an adult, Bob. He's going on a trip with his wife, Wanda. I could make a very easy joke right now. And their three kids, Cindy, Erin, and Tyler. They're going camping. Dude, Bob might just be the biggest prick so far in one of these. For the entire first half of the story, it's just him bitching constantly at the state of his life. Feeling like he has no time for himself. Boo hoo, I have a loving wife and kids, woe is me. The guy literally says that he loves his family, but recently has been liking them less and less. Fuck you. He's so pissed that he's gotta spend time with his family, that he decides to play a silly prank on them. Opting in for the camp's feature of having a giant bunny called Ralpho come into the cabin at 5am to scream and slam his symbols together to wake everyone up. <laughs> what a silly prank. I was not having this one for the first half. I did not give a shit about Bob or his family. But somehow, halfway through, they managed to rope me back in. After a terrible day of camp activities, Bob gets ready for bed with his wife. And when everything is quiet in the night, he comes to realize that he really does love his family and cares about them. Makes you in turn care about him more, and recognize that he was irrationally saying those things out of irritation for having to go somewhere he didn't want to. But oh no. 
the bunny call. He runs out of the house trying to predict when it's gonna come, and winds up having a pleasant conversation with another man in the exact same scenario as him. I love this talk. They discuss their own parents, things they regret having done in the past, and coming to terms with the fact that they're becoming just like their own fathers. And with that, Bob knows he needs to go back and protect them from the bunny call. The rest of the story is great. It plays out exactly like a FNAF game. None of these have really attempted to do that so far, with Bob having to look all around the house to the different entry points where Ralpha was attempting to come in, not even coming off as human and having blood splattered on his hands. Again, I would really want to see a fan game based off this scenario, with him having to keep Ralpha out of the cabin from 5am to 6am. And what makes it even creepier is he doesn't even know what'll happen when the bunny gets in the room, he's acting on pure instinct. It ends with Bob having his It's a Wonderful Life moment. 6am comes, the bunny leaves, and he lets his family know just how much he loves and cares for them. Aww. Aww. It's a new day and the camp counselor is making an announcement. My apologies to those who signed up for a bunny call. The bunny calls couldn't be done this morning, because the counselor who usually does bunny calls overslept. Ralpho wasn't able to make his rhymes today. Wait a minute. So... So what was trying to get into Bob's cabin? Oh my god! Bunny Call was solid. It's nice to see them try and take a break from being interconnected to the FNAF lore and have a one-off that's unrelated to Freddy and gang. And unlike some others, the lack of explanation makes things creepier. Bunny Call is a good. I suppose to balance it out though, our next story in the flesh has to be the absolute worst shit ever conceived by man. Oh yeah. We're at the Springtrap Vor. And sadly, Vor isn't even the right term, it's too team. Vor implies eating someone. This is better summed up as Springtrap Mpreg. Not an improvement. And possibly our most meta story yet, Matt is a game dev working on the biggest project of his career, the next installment in the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, the VR game Springtrap's Revenge. From the get-go, the wording here is very obvious in what direction they're about to go, with them describing Springtrap as a child of Matt's rage. Yeah, a child? That's how you want to word that? Okay, cool. Matt might take the cake for worst protagonist here. At least Bob had some sort of turnaround by the end. But Matt has to be one of the most unlikable characters in any of these books so far. First of all, the guy keeps dying when playtesting his own game, and starts raging like he's some kind of angry video game nerd. When we spell it out, you're a poopy head. He dies so much, again, to his own fictional game, that he screams and throws his coffee mug at the wall. What a baby. We also learn about his short-lasting marriage with a girl named Tana, saying that he loved it at first because he saw it as winning her, but quickly got bored. Dude literally says, the novelty of her worn off. On top of that, he thinks he has the best ideas in the world, finding his weekly game dev meetings pointless because he knows that nobody is as cool or based as him. Yeah, the same guy who couldn't beat his own level wants to preach to us. And on top of all that, we see him go on like two more dates within the story, and at both he's nothing but a pretentious loser. In one, he outwardly mocks the woman's weight, despite having a belly on him himself, and in the other, his roommate has sat him up with a friend of a girl he's going on a date with, being pissed because she looks too plain for him, and then when his friend goes to take a piss, he tries to convince the bitch to go out with him instead. Whatever happens to you, buddy, I've got front row tickets. He's such a pussy, too. He decides he's gonna take out all his rage on Springtrap, a fictional character, by removing the player model from the game and speeding up the clock meaning he traps Springtrap in the game by himself all night, which in the fictional universe is more like weeks. He takes his anger out on a couple lines of code, and still loses. Basically, throughout the rest of the book, he notices that his game has been fucking up. He sees that all the code is out of whack with the old Springtrap being gone, having spawned a new one who kills the old, who spawns a new one that kills the old, and the cycle repeats until we see a kid called Gene hack into the mainframe and obtain an early version of the game, where he looks into the code and finds a file called itsaboy.exe. Great, we almost got halfway through the novel series before EXEs were brought up. From here, Matt's health starts to degrade. His roommate has left him all alone, he has no friends, no one who cares about him, and while his tummy starts to get bigger and bigger, they even have him stuffing his face with tons of food and clarify how gassy he feels. Ugh. He feels something crawling around inside of him, and in so much pain he lays down on the ground and slices his stomach open. And what emerges is an infant-sized spring trap whom crawls over to Matt, strokes his head, and calls him Daddy. That was everything I had expected, and I'm still in shock. I have no idea how this idea was approved. I get that maybe they wanted to try their hand at a bit of body horror, but there's no way that Scott looked at this and didn't think about how this was going to be perceived by fans. This was by far the Fazbear Fright story I heard about most before going into the video. So hey, if his goal was to rile up fans and have them talking about the book series to drive up seals, then okay, I can see why. But still, In the Flesh is the worst one, by far. I think we've reached rock bottom. Rock bottom. 
But hey, never say never. The man in 1280 is the complete opposite of the previous one, focusing on an elderly priest named Arthur, whose job it is to visit dying patients and talk to them about the afterlife. Today, he's visiting a special case, a man who's turned to nothing more than a charred skeleton, being on life support for years. And when the hospital finally decides to pull the plug, there he lay, still breathing, sitting there dormant in room 1280. I like the relationship Arthur has with one of the new nurses, Maya, who he has an almost fatherly role for. You see, <laughs> get it? Father, like... Like a priest? Uh, sorry, I mean, woo! Freddy Fazbear, funny Markiplier gifts for everyone! The nurses claim that the man is evil, saying that after a brain scan, they found there were two entities living inside the tortured soul, tormenting each other endlessly. And when the priest tries to talk with him, he directs him towards Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center, signaling that he wishes to go there. I gotta tell you, reading like 40 pages of this serious-ass story, only to have the word Fazbear dropped in was total whiplash, I was not ready for it. But either way, while Arthur attempts to convince the hospital to let him take the man to the center as his dying wish, the three nurses are trying to prematurely kill him, again, believing him to be evil. These suspicions are proven right, though, when each attempt at this feels spectacularly. Someone or something doesn't want this man to die. And on top of all that, there's a small boy with black curly hair roaming the hospital. Nobody being able to catch it. Wait a second, black curly hair? But the kid inside the Golden Freddy suit from the New Kid story also had black curly hair. There's no way they'd specify this shit and not have it be intentional. Uh, spoiler warning, they do nothing with this. For now. Also, speaking of connections, it turns out that this is the man that Andrew was talking about in the previous epilogue, the guy who he didn't want to let die. The evil force here is Andrew. Thank you, Allison. The story ends with Arthur taking the man to Freddy's, in which he collapses into nothing, before the priest hears something quickly run away, leaving nothing but bloody footsteps. Well, that was different. Well, I liked how different it was, though. It's hard to convey in a summarized review, but they do an excellent job here at building atmosphere. There's a much slower pace to this one, which is greatly appreciated after whatever the fuck happened last story. And with that, we're another book down. Bunny Call is one of the best so far, in my opinion. And while A Man in Room 1280 was also very enjoyable, I can't lie and say In the Flesh doesn't bring the whole thing down. Don't get me wrong, I was enthralled by how awful it was, but I don't think it crept me out in the way the writer had intended. Still, though, let's get into the epilogue, in which we see Detective Larson again, taking a hard look at the crime scene for Dr. Phineas. He realizes this whole thing is somehow connected to the Freddy murders, thinking that maybe the Stitchrith is looking for evidence that was found at the fire site, which apparently was connected to one of the Freddy's finders. Also, I'm pretty sure the fire site is where the charred skeleton man in the previous story died. Um, so, you know, maybe it's William Afton, ooh. But right as it seems like he's found something interesting, we switch to a guy called Grimm, who, if you remember, had witnessed the Stitchrith pick up the plush trap chaser at the train tracks. He follows the thing to an opening that leads to a floor of an old factory filled with junk, seeing the Stitchrith drag a bag containing the Ella doll from the sleeping story a while back. And while this happens, Jake, who again is controlling the Stitchrith with Andrew, has a memory of him and his father from back when he was just a boy, before forgetting it so he can continue on with his mission of retrieving all the items. I think it's safe to say that the Stitchrith maybe isn't the villain he had initially been presented as, so I'm interested to see how this is going to play out between Detective Larson and him. Again, though, it's a little too early to call any shots. Moving on. I love how experimental I've been getting with these covers. Blackbird is super enticing, with this completely black feathered figure with solid little yellow dot eyes staring into your soul. I appreciate them taking more risks and creating a cover that's cooler, in exchange for probably not being as appealing to the kitties as a, you know, big yellow rabbit. The imagery very much so fits the theme of the book, being haunted by the past and such. So either way, let's start with the opening story, Blackbird. Sam and his friend Noel are both in college, and are tasked with creating a horror movie, so they create this creature beast of a blackbird, with it forcing you to tell it your secrets, in which afterwards it'll stalk you as punishment. So, coincidentally, Sam asks Noel what a secret is. I wonder where this is going. Noel lets Sam know that back when he was younger he was a bit of a bully, especially picking on this one girl called Charlotte, being a large reason why a majority of students would make fun of her. But I'm sure this'll never come up again anytime soon. Sam gets hit by a tree and... Yeah, no, Noel finds out that his good friend Sam, who he had argued with the previous night about the bullying thing, was hit by a train and is missing. Black feathers scattered around the tracks. And from here, Noel can't shake the feeling that he's being watched everywhere he goes. I enjoy their argument at the beginning about whether horror needs to be all bloody and whatnot, and if that added to the creep factor, with Noel thinking it was necessary, only for him to realize that later on he's basically having a horror movie play out before his very eyes. No blood. 
It's all scenes of him almost falling asleep before seeing that something is in the room with him, driving him mad and running out into the street screaming, his guilty conscience poking its head out as he begins unknowingly saying his thoughts to people. From here, he realizes what he needs to do and has to apologize to Charlotte. I love the scene of him having to confront her parents about what he had done, with them remembering what he had done to her. They sell the awkwardness very well with him seeing the consequences of what he did, even realizing that she's doing way better right now, saying that the bullying almost helped her in a way, made her work for what she currently has. Which is fine for the story and all, but isn't the best message. I'm sure there are kids out there reading this book that have been fucked up from bullying. She forgives him and all is well. The blackbird disappears and Sam is even okay. Apparently he survived the train hitting him, and he was just being a silly little guy and not looking at where he was walking. <laughs> oh, Sam. There's a line near the end of the story where Sam reveals a secret, saying that he got back at one of the jerks who bullied him, and I'm not sure if that was just a throwaway line or whatever, but is it implying that Sam was the one behind all this? I mean, it wouldn't make sense for him to fake his death and shit, I don't think I'd put my family through that for the sake of trolling. Not to mention, I don't think Noel and Sam went to school together when they were younger, since him being a bully wouldn't have been a secret then, but either way, I enjoyed Blackbird. Considering a lot of the other stories have been very high in my bar so far, it doesn't stand out a ton. If I were doing some sort of ranking, it'd probably be around the middle of the list. Maybe a tiny bit higher, but still good. Could this be the first book to have all the stories be of a high quality? Let's hope to God with... The Real Jick. Going back to the hospital theme from last book, except this time there's no priest, instead a little kid called Jake. He's got a tumor, and from what the nurses are saying, it doesn't look like he's got much hope of improving. He's stuck in bed all day under the care of a nurse named Maggie, who's gotten very attached to his family, mainly Jake's father who's usually away as he's in the army. Not the mum though, because this is a FNAF book and there's some sort of unspoken rule that at least one of the parents must be dead. Things aren't all bad, however, because every night Jake's friend Simon visits him. Instead of asking Jake about all the stuff he really did all day, you know, laying in bed and peeing into a pan, he has him make up a day filled with fun and friends, helping Jake cope, and in a way makes these wishes come true. Only issue is, Simon lives in his cabinet. I was not expecting this Simon shit to go in the direction it did, with him refusing to hear Jake saying anything other than his fabricated dare, and even claims that he did all the same stuff too, saying that whenever Jake is all better he can finally go to the cabinet and see Simon. I thought it was gonna be like a demon or something that becomes free once Jake lets him out, but the real twist? It's fucking sad. Every time Jake mentions a detail of something that did that day to Simon, when he's sleeping, Margie comes in and opens the cabinet, where it's revealed that Simon is just a blank white doll. And she sits and adds little details to represent the activity. Jake mentions scraping grass on his knee, Margie adds it to Simon. Jake talks about eating popcorn, she'll draw some in his teeth. And what's even sadder is Simon's voice is provided by Jake's dad while he's out in the army, feeling like his son would be able to connect more with someone that seemed like more his own age. It appears to really help Jake cope with his worsening situation. Acting like he did all those things almost makes them real in a way. Although one day Margie gets a phone call that changes everything. Jake's father, Evan, has died in the army, and has to sit Jake down and let him know that Simon won't be visiting that night. And before she can even give him the news of what happened to his father, Jake dies. There is no horror in this story at all, but that almost makes me like it more. There was nothing tacked on here to try and make it more frightening for a FNAF fan, it's just, it's just a sad, real story of a father trying to make a sick kid happy. And that's really special amongst these other ones like Springtrap Ampreg and Texting Dogs. That is up until the end, you know, they gotta tie it in somehow. When Margie rushes into the room to see Jake has died, across from him sits the cabinet where Simon was waiting, except the door is open and Simon is gone. It took me a sec to realize what happened here, and by realize, I mean I asked a friend, thank you Allison again. Remember how I said in the FNAF universe a soul is composed of memories, and how talking with the doll almost made them real to Jake in a way? Well, it turns out that by doing that, he did make them real, and so once Jake died, his spirit went and possessed the doll. And to further integrate it to the ongoing plot, it appears that this doll, Simon, is the exact same one that Dr. Phineas received in the epilogue story from a couple books ago. If you remember the one from the Stitchress perspective, the kid talking from within it was called Jake. So yeah, um, this Jake is the Stitchress. Kinda, you know, like he's part of it, but you know what I mean. Also, I would not have noticed this if it weren't for me reading lines for book two earlier today, but I noticed that the epilogue there has Detective Larson investigating the very same cabinet. You know, the one with all the black scrapings on the wall. I can see this all connecting like a Five Nights at Freddy's cinematic universe. I'm just over here waiting for when we get our Avenger-style movie, Fazbear and Friends. I think the real Jake is the best of both worlds. It manages to be a fairly self-contained plot about a serious situation that they treat with the grindedness it deserves, while still managing to naturally integrate it to the main story of the books, without it ruining everything that led up to it. It's definitely in my top five so far. Alright, here we go. Can the final story hide and seek give us three for three? Let's see what we got here. 
So Toby's a gamer, goddammit. Toby is this freaking awesome gamer who works at Freddy's, spending all his free time trying to get the high scores in all the arcade games, but he could never manage to beat his big brother's high score, who's number one at them all. But wait, a new game just opened called Hide and Seek. This is Toby's time to shine. Hide and Seek sucks, I did not like it at all. And not in a funny way I like Into the Flesh. Here we see him, similarly to that protagonist, get more and more angry at the video game each time he loses. What, what is it with these kids and yelling at inanimate objects? The guy literally says to himself, mm, I, I'm not a freaking loser. Yeah, you tell him, buddy. The only neat idea here is that after he rages and destroys the arcade game, he notices that the shadow of Bonnie is following him all around, getting bigger and darker by the day. That's a cool concept if it weren't just a reskinned version of Blackbird, which isn't helped by the fact that these are in the same book. Same girl introduced to try and help them with the situation at hand, except this time when that doesn't work, some kid at the arcade gives him the helpful advice of, dude, you're a gamer, use your imagination. The main character here is just a bona fide loser all around. He literally tries to drown himself at one point to see if it would remove the shadow and scrubs his back down to the point of being all cut up. And you think it's gonna get better. After he talks with his brother, who by the way has the most generic sibling rivalry, you're a loser, I'm better, conversation ever with him, Toby realizes that he doesn't care about winning anymore. He finds out that the game is busted, and the reason the Shadow Bonnie is following him is because it still thinks it's in play, so he has to go swallow his pride and forfeit. He knows what a normal person would do. Instead, when he hovers over the forfeit button, he says fuck humidity and hits continue, which kills him. Great, killed yourself for an arcade game you still lost anyway, you deserve to die honestly. Hide and seek leaves a bad taste in my mouth, but I still thoroughly enjoyed the first two stories in this one. We end with Larson approaching the factory, where he soon realizes something is in there with him. He watches as the Stitchrith empties a garbage bag containing Foxy, and as Larson makes his presence known, we see the inner turmoil of the thing, with Jake trying to stop Andrew from killing them by escaping down a chute. Jake can feel himself setting free, moving on to the afterlife, but he can't leave Andrew who's being dragged down by this strange force. Wait, no, it, it, it's not a force, it looks like a creature from hell with... Rabbit? E oh, it's William Afton again. Is that really the only villain we can use here? Maybe I'm spoiled on purple guy reveals ever since Security Breach shoehorned him in at the last five minutes. But again, I liked that William Afton was just a guy, not this strange being who can do anything he wants. It makes him less cool to me. But anyway, Andrew breaks free, but Jake doesn't. Larson takes away the trash and laments how he needs to spend more time with his son, as back in the factory the discarded trash rises from the ground and assembles into a 15 foot tall mess of parts. It rejects a part of itself, tossing it aside, and looms right over the detective. Dun dun dun! Okay, I'll give you this, that ending wrote me back in. It's weird that it seems like they're gearing us up for a finale when we're only halfway there, but still, I'm curious to see where they take this. <laughs> The Cliffs might just have the most boring cover yet out of any of these. They just uh, ripped up Freddy Fazbear plush in the woods. It might be the composition, honestly. It's so flat. Funnily enough, a reason for this might have to do with some behind the scenes elements. See, originally the book was meant to be called The Breaking Wheel, which was switched around to the middle story. The reason for this being that the cover they had initially drawn for it was deemed too scary. And I can see what that mean. Suppose it's a neat bit of body horror. And I don't just mean the way this kid was drawn. But still, aren't these the same books that plaster all over the covers how scary they are? How they can make any hardcore FNAF fan piss their pants? I kinda miss when the franchise wasn't directed towards kids this outwardly, but that point in its history is long, long past. So instead of starting with the Brigham Wheel, we have the Cliffs. A tale which features a man called Robert. Would you believe me if I told you his wife was dead? With that, he's left alone taking care of his two-year-old son Tyler, living in a house situated on a cliff, with one of the points being known as prime real estate for super hides. We see a lot of how the death of his spice has affected Robert, and I think it's the highlight, honestly. Like most of the other stories around this length, about 50 or so pages, it's structured in a very simple way where the first 40 or so mostly just establishes day by day, with the last being jam-packed with spooks. But if you've noticed a pattern so far, it's those ones that I find benefit Fazbear Frights greatly. I really liked Robert and feel for his dilemma, not feeling like he's enough to take care of his kid and just wants to be there for him, but being too closed off to let anybody else in, not even talking to Tyler about who his mother was. 
Sorry, anyway, let's get into the Freddy involvement. At the store, Robert buys Tyler a tag-along Freddy plush, which has this wonderful feature that allows Freddy to text you updates about your kid. This appears to be a very helpful tool at first, keeping track of Tyler even when he's at work and such. When Robert leaves his son outside with Freddy to quickly grab his phone, he receives a text. Gone. The fuck do you mean, gone? I'm not sure how I feel about where they go with this. In some ways I like it, in other ways I don't. While the police are doing investigations for his lost son, the Freddy continuously texts Robert, saying repeatedly, why don't you go to the cliffs? Even when he burns the thing, it still somehow manages to text him the same thing. Robert takes this as the Freddy toying with him, encouraging him to go jump, kill himself. Now! And when he runs up the cliff to throw Freddy across the edge, he hears crying. I it's Tyler. It turns out that he was just... Chasing a dog the whole time, oh, okay. See, I like the tormenting part, and a part of me is glad that Tyler and Robert end the story safe and alright. I, I like their relationship, so the last thing I would want is for one of them to die. But like, I feel like one of them should have died. Because of this nothing conclusion, where his son going missing really had nothing to do with the Freddy, it makes me wonder what I'm supposed to be scared of here. Was Freddy really texting him? Why? I think two ways I would have gone about this was either have Robert go to the top and look down, seeing his son's body laying at the bottom with Freddy in his hand, like the Freddy instead encouraged Tyler to kill himself. Now! In which Robert realizes that he misinterpreted Freddy's text of, why don't you go to the cliffs, not being, you should kill yourself now! Instead, hey, go check what I did at the cliffs. Lol. Alternatively, have the Freddy succeed in driving Robert to suicide, where he jumps off the cliff, and as he's falling down, he sees Tyler's head pop up from the top of the cliff as he watches his dad die. I don't know, those are just off the top of my head, but the point is, I would've preferred something more impactful. But, twas okay. I enjoyed my time with it, and I guess that's what counts the most. I will say, though, I am getting a little tired. I'm not used to all this reading. If only there were somebody who could read this next story for me so that I could take a quick break, preferably someone FNAF related. Um, I said, if only there was somebody who could read this next story for me so I could take a quick break. Go motion, fucking that's, that's your cue. Oh, what? Hi. Hi, what? Hi, Mark. What? You want me to read something? Uh, interesting that you looked at the two bullet holes in my head and assumed that they had functioning pupils. But I'll bite. What the hell is this? Scott Cawthon? Oh my god, that's my favourite movie. Let me dig in. The Breaking Wheel. Here we meet Reed and his genius twin best friends Pickle and Shelly. They're all freshmen dicking around in a robotics class that Reed doesn't want to be in or has much interest in, making him a prime target for teacher's pet and school bully Julius. This guy is the bee's thyroid, the jack of all bull sacks, and when Julius activates the highly advanced exoskeleton he built for a goddamn school project in order to brag to Reed, it short circuits and Julius almost fucking dies. Taking advantage of his potentially electrocuted classmate, Reed slams shut the exoskeleton, says sayonara to Julius, begging to be freed from the metallic calamity, leaving him in the locked classroom for dead, basically. Reed catches the bus home, letting his guilt catch up to him as Shelly reads up about torture devices, the breaking wheel, the most noteworthy of which, at which point the story takes the opportunity to start describing, in excruciating detail, the idea of somebody's bloody, mangled, tentacle corpse. This happens like three times. Did I mention the comprehension level here seems to be designed for children around 10 years of age? Reed hangs out with his friends at their house, also their six-year-old brother is there, and they're all working on gadgets and school shit. When the kid brother starts messing with a remote for a robot, the keeps ramming into a replica of the very house they're all currently inside, except the remote also controls the exoskeleton Julius was trapped in or something. Something about an IR or an RF remote that was foreshadowed in the beginning of the story I don't really remember. It's voodoo robot shit, don't think about it. Fast forward, Reed, believing that the noises are real and not just a figment of his guilty guilty imagination, declines to go out with his friends to get soda, instead staying around the house trying to find Julius. And Reed has this incredible premonition like, ooh, Oh shit, Julius is definitely mangled up inside the exoskeleton and he's a big old zombie now and everything, which is an obviously exaggerated idea of something that would not actually happen to Julius, and he chills out for a bit messing with the replica house, only for Julius to pop up behind the replica house looking exactly like Reed imagined, which 
it was the opposite of scary, in my opinion. Anyway, so this hideous zombie corpse chases after Reed, fuses with him, and yep, I checked, this is a 12 and up. Okay, so with the varyingly simplified writing style, barrage of extra characters, and general not good pacing of the story as a whole, I can't pretend it was very easy for my ADHD inattentive ass to follow along with most of the details here, but to me, this felt like a very bare bones tale aimed at younger readers, with an uncomfortable amount of tonal switches flipping from a very awkwardly written bullying scene one minute, and vivid descriptions of the bully's bones popping and flesh tearing the next. It's not creepy or scary really, just weirdly unnecessary in a universe already happily populated with child death, thank you very much. And please, do pardon my being 21 years old, but I never found this very suspenseful either. I was genuinely too caught up in trying to keep myself interested enough in menial and often unnecessary descriptors of what was going on here to keep track of the damn main story. It's very much not for me, but outside of that, the breaking wheel reads to me as a confusing mess that loses sight of why the concept of dead kids was so effective in the first few Five Nights games. It was because you knew so little. The discomforting aura from ye old lore came strictly from fear of the unknown. It implies that the purple guy stuffed a bunch of kids' corpses into animatronic mascots, and that's enough to leave the imagination wondering, shit dick. All I gathered from this was a series of overly illustrated torture descriptions, and the main character's anxiously cooked up depiction of his bully's potential fate just realized right in front of him. Which is what happens, by the way, somehow Reed just totally fucking nails how he feared Julius was gonna end up, so adios to any kind of interesting reveal either. I don't know, I think overall it just felt so flat for me, and that I'm honestly glad I'm hanging out in sewage water rather than actively engaging in this video game series anymore. Heyo! Alright, back down I go, don't forget to throw a couple food scraps down here sometimes, Mark, I'm <laughs> kind of dying of starvation. <laughs> Bye! Thanks, dickhead. I can only hope now that they've saved the best for last. He told me everything. The main character here, Chris, reminds me of uh, Matilda, living in a house with a mother obsessed with her looks and a dad who works with cars, being sort of brash and defensive. Only difference here is they can never top Danny DeVito. Listen, you little wiseacre. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it. Chris is such a fucking whiner, I hate him. I think they were going for a Greg Heffley kind of protagonist here, where you're supposed to find their grandiose sense of self-endearing, but they fucked it up so bad. The story literally starts with Chris complaining to his family that he wishes they were nicer. And by nicer, he means to have a nice house and nice clothes. Stuff he can brag about to people. He has this way of twisting good shit to make it sound like a problem, and it makes him insufferable. Like, when he wanted a purebreed dog because they're fancy, his dad gets one from the pond. Sure, because they're cheaper, but also because it means they're rescuing an animal shelter dog potentially from death. And Chris somehow spins this to make it sound like his dad is in the wrong. Much like Greg, he has a couple friends that he thinks he's better than, Josh and Kyle, lamenting how when they enter high school in the coming days, he's not going to talk to them anymore as he's got his cool-ass future to think about. The difference between Greg and he, though, is that Greg was never too outward with his feelings. Sure, he thinks poorly of Riley, but we also see them share genuine moments together that build their bond. Not to mention he rarely outwardly said this stuff to his face, trying to sound nicer with it. And when he does, he gets consistently beat down upon for the way he behaves, giving you an immediate sense of justice. Chris in general is also just a huge fucking loser. Greg wants to be rich and famous. What does Chris want? To be in the science club. Dork. Thankfully, this is where it begins to pick up, but not in a good way. Chris's eccentric science teacher Mr. Little is having a lock-in, where students who are interested in joining his club have to come after school and prove they're worthy. Although not everything is as it seems, with Josh and Kyle hearing rumors around school that it's like some sort of cult. But Chris thinks so lowly of his peers that he doesn't give a shit, and this is his big chance to transform, as the teacher puts it. From here, the thing takes a complete 180. Mr. Little informs them that, and this is real by the way, that their experiment involves each of them being given a Freddy Fazbear Mad Scientist kit, taking out some Faz goo. Again, this is real. And from there, they have to grab some pliers and physically pull a tooth out and place it in the Faz goo. Then wait and see what happens. A mental change, apparently. What is Faz goo? Well, apparently, it's a substance that will somehow make your tooth not realize that it's no longer a part of your body. It'll grow a new mouth and then say something to you. What do you mean that doesn't answer what Fazgoo is? Being squeamish, Chris cheats by using an old baby tooth of his instead of plucking one out. And from here, things go horribly wrong. A full human organism starts to form, a strange pinkish clone of Chris. It's slowly stealing his body parts as the real Chris turns into nothing more than a blob that's disposed of. Pink Chris then walks away to assume his role as the real one. 
He's now welcomed into the cult. What? I think they imply this is what happened to all the kids. So using his baby tooth had no real consequences. But either way, this shit is dumb as hell. There is no explanation for why any of this happens. Pulling shit out of their asses and hope you don't question it. I've heard from folks that the books start to get worse and worse from this point on. So I certainly hope trans like fucking Fazgoo don't become common. Finally, our epilogue. Which are only getting longer and longer as these go on. This one is like almost half the length of the cliff story. But we pick up right where the last left off. Larson sees the strange algamation headed towards him, where he runs and hides, only to see the Stitcherith arise from the trash compactor. Yeah, it was the thing that William Afton rejected. The old Eleanor endoskeleton is here too, trying to fight Jake, absorbing the bad energy from him. A lot of the animatronic debris around him wants to be part of the mess. Afton's amalgamation beats down on Larson, stabbing him in the stomach not realizing that he's now been infected with that spirit. Larson notices the trash bag he's been carrying the whole time starting to move. He opens it to see a mask with red, rosy cheeks and purple tears coming down its hollow eyes. <gasps> the puppet! It wants to be taken to Afton. After a failed attempt to defeat him, William looks down at Larson and proudly exclaims, I am agony. Again, some real Sonic.exe territory here. But before he can make his final move, the puppet causes all of the animatronic debris to separate from Afton, weakening him. He falls back into the lake as it swallows every piece, leaving just one, the floating puppet mask. From here, Jake heals Detective Larson, getting rid of the bad Afton energy in his body. And just when he leaves to retreat back into the factory, he has a realization. William Afton wasn't the main threat. And whatever it is, it was much, much worse. There's more? This shit seriously felt like an alright conclusion. Was well, getting a little silly with the giant robot William Afton, but I would have been satisfied if they called it quits at this point. But no, apparently this was just the beginning. So let's see where this shit show takes us in. Anyone else think the cover for this one looks like that one bartender's wife from Flapjack? You know what, I actually think that one looks creepier than this, honestly. Th that show in general was just, just on some shit. Before I get into it, I sadly gotta say I don't think this book review will be anywhere near as long as the other ones, because at this rate I'm noticing how fucking repetitive they're becoming. Put a, put a sound effect here if I just end up rambling anyway, and it's the same length as the others. Case in point, Gumdrop Angel. From the very goddamn beginning you can see where this is gonna go. Hell, I'd argue that just looking at the cover already gives you an idea of what's gonna happen, and I'd at least hope that the build up would make it worth it, but... It doesn't. We start with our protagonist, Angel. She's currently at the last place you'd ever expect. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. It's her stepsister Ophelia's birthday, and by God do they want you to know how much she despises her, along with her stepfather. For good reason, too. Angel has a pretty crappy life. Ophelia gets everything she wants. For her birthday, she's given a pony and a horse, a big birthday at Freddy's. Meanwhile, Angel isn't even getting help paying for her college tuition. He's pretty adamant about the fact that he doesn't like her, literally saying that she's along for the ride while he fucks her mom. Her student loan is even eventually declined because the board finds out that her stepdad could easily pay for it himself. So naturally, Angel deserves to be punished for this. She's had it too good for too long. At the birthday, the kids are shown this giant gummy candy lady, who squirms and screams as the children gather around and eat it, leaving just its gumdrop nose. It's only for the birthday girl, and she's choosing to keep it. You can see where this is going. Again, Angel really doesn't do anything wrong here, unless I'm supposed to believe her rightfully calling out her stepdad on his favoritism, and her own mother doing nothing about it, is her being entitled in some way. Really, the only thing she has going for her is her great singing abilities, in which teachers tell her, Audiences are just gonna eat you up. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Yada yada, Angel has a fight with her parents, and in retaliation goes and eats her sister's gumdrop nose. But oh no, she's starting to feel funny. She starts to get a strange squishy rash all over her body, and nothing can be done about it. And when she's directed to go back to Freddy's for help, she's placed inside a box, only to feel herself being lowered down more and more, before being welcomed by blinding colored lights and screaming children. The announcer then tells the kids to have at it, as Angel is eaten alive. Yeah, bitch, that'll teach you for, uh, calling out your oppressor, dumbass. If you couldn't tell already, I'm not the biggest fan of Gumdrop Angel. I just can't believe there were eight books in at this point, and they're still doing this concept that they've already covered. In a worse way, too. At the very least, Lonely Freddy wasn't so avert from the get-go, but here I just felt nothing. I want to care about Angel's mistreatment, but because you can tell exactly what's going to happen, I find it hard to want to connect with her, knowing that she'll be dead by the end of it. The biggest pro here is that the concept of being eaten alive is very scary, but that's about it. 
Maybe Sergio's lucky deck can put us in better spirits. Sergio is such an uncommon name to me that when I hear it, I can only think about the Sergio Show. You ever heard of the Sergio Show? It's a very underrated YouTube series. It's been going on for over 30 seasons. My personal favorite is episode 220 and episode 156. The special episode that's a five minute build up to the titular Sergio taking a shit. Go check it out. Sergio's just been promoted at his big architecture job to project manager, but despite all the praise he's getting for his hard work, he still struggles to be happy about it. He's unsatisfied and only wants more. He's upset that his father still expects more from him. He's upset about all the extra work he now has to do, without that much of a pair rise. And he's very upset that he doesn't truly love his girlfriend, Violet. Although you could've fooled me with the way he talks to her, saying shit like, You look sexy as heck, babe. Love is clearly in the air at the Dominguez house. As the title would suggest, however, Things seem to be taking a turn for the better when he finds a Balloon Boy toy on the grind one night. Except it's not exactly Balloon Boy, instead being Lucky Boy, who tells Sergio that it's gonna be his lucky dare. And he's right! He wins the lottery, buys a car and a watch, goes to buy a house and start up his own architecture company, and so quits his job, even breaking up with Violet. All from the suggestions he's being given from Lucky Boy. The main issue with this story is that where it's going is fairly obvious. Like, yeah, no shit this is gonna backfire spectacularly. But I gotta say, I enjoyed where they go with it. I just think maybe they could have built up to it better. It's clear near the end that Sergio is going a bit crazy, putting all his trust in a toy. But they don't build up to his insanity very well. At least given the ending, which I'll discuss in a second. But I think maybe they could have cut a bit of the establishment at the start, in favor of focusing more on his brick darn. Because he goes from just being a little too protective of the doll, like trying to keep hold of it while driving, and so swerves and crashes, getting sued by the lady in the passenger seat. Which, yeah, is bad, but kind of makes sense since it was giving him all this good fortune. But they then go to him wanting to look perfect at his high school reunion, to woo the girl he liked back then. So much so that he grabs a razor and a knife and starts cutting away at his imperfect features like his nose and ears, all because Lucky Boy told him to, ending the story with him entering the thing as a mangled bloody mess but not really noticing. That's a really cool ending, I love that. The idea of him giving so much mental power to a doll, to the point where he does all this stuff to himself is creepy, but I feel like they were maybe missing a section where they more gradually show him reaching that point. And again, that's mainly an issue because a lot of the beginning was spent showing him in his current situation. Or hey, if you wanted to keep that, maybe you could have cut out one of the times he buys a car. Yeah, he buys a car, drives it to work, it gets stolen, then he just buys a cheaper one. Like, cool, yeah, that was needed. Either way, I still enjoyed Sergio's lucky day a hell of a lot more than the last, so I can at least appreciate that fact. Now the last story, what we find. It had me the most interested. Given it's a direct adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's 3, we don't really get many straight up game stuff in these stories anymore, so I was excited to see how they'd tackle my favorite, well, visually favorite at least, FNAF game. Not well. Well, okay, it's not awful or anything, but I can't lie and say I'm not at least a little disappointed at how it ended up. But that just might be down to, again, this being my favorite FNAF game, story and aesthetic wise. So maybe nothing would have satisfied me, who knows. Hudson is the security guard at the new Fazbear Frights attraction. His dad is dead. We learn about his tragic past. Once his father died, his new one, Lewis, would beat him and break his bones, constantly tearing him down as a kid. Although we eventually learn of the horrors that caused not only his stepdad, but also his mother's death, being a house fire that many believe Hudson himself started. Spoilers, he did. This is me and Hudson at a bit of an outcast, being bullied at school, no girl wants to fuck him because they think he's a murderer. No time to worry about that though, because a new attraction has just been brought into the place. A real one. Hudson's only friends hang the new greenish rabbit animatronic onto the wall, and leave him there to guard it for the next six hours. What follows is Hudson experiencing a bunch of mental torment, having nightmares from his past come into reality to haunt him. The animatronic is now missing, traveling up in the vents somewhere as he constantly hears the voices of people judging him, the teacher calling him stupid, a girl asking him if he were responsible for killing his parents, even visions of his stepfather beating him, which appears to be taking effect in real life, being bashed into toilets and having his wrist broken for peeing his pants. He takes a real beating here. We're never really told whether or not it's the keyist, I guess it's up for interpretation, but by the end when his friends return, Springtrap is still in the same place, not moving. There's the implication that Hudson was just going crazy the whole night, his mind playing tricks on him to relive past trauma. But if that's the case, I don't know, that's fucking lame. How are you going to adapt FNAF 3 and not have Springtrap doing shit? They make it clear there's a corpse inside the suit too, so clearly William Afton is around here somewhere. I guess maybe you could give the excuse that the bad remnant coming off of Afton is causing the hallucinations. Which I am glad to see appear here. It took me a bit to realize, but it was a clever way of approaching the phantom animatronics we see in that game. But still, it was whatever, I wasn't hugely into this one. It ends with Hudson hiding in the kitchen oven, only for it to heat up and burn him alive. I figured that's how they were going to cover the building burning down. 
you know, being what causes William Afton's corpse to become charred, winding up in the hospital back in room 1280. But no, they avoid that obvious connection for reasons I can't tell. Bookie it was a mixed bag for sure. Sergio's Lucky Day was definitely my favorite, and even then, I still didn't love it or anything. It was sort of the best of a lackluster bunch. What we find definitely had the most potential, though. I just wish something different were done with it. Although, I can't exactly think of what that might be. I don't know, if you have any ideas, let me know in the comments. What I'm most curious about is what they're going to do with these epilogues now, given the seemingly climatic ending and cliffhanger we ended on last time. We catch up with Larson, who's waking up in hospital after the events of what William and Jake had done to him. Eventually, when home, he starts experiencing weird visions of the past, memories that weren't his own, with the one constant thing between them being a ball pit. He knows that he has to find it to finally fit the puzzle pieces together. We then follow Jake, who's been hiding ever since the incident, soon finding out that he can now touch people without killing them like before. He finds out that he can go into people's memories and make them think of it. Oh, hey, I just realized that's probably what was happening in the What We Find story when he touched Springtrap. It was giving him those memories. What, we're done that. He finds a teenage girl and protects her from two dealers trying to get money from her. But before we can see more of that, we go back to Larson, who's just entered the famous Jeff's Pizza and Find the Ball Pit, covered in old, dried-up blood. We end with Jake taking care of the girl in the shed, before hearing something rattling outside. What could it be? Buy the next book and find out! Don't have a ton to say here. I guess it's strange that they're trying to go all the way back and integrate into the pit back end of this as a focal point. Not really sure what was so significant about that story, but I guess that's why we gotta keep reading and see what's up. What a lousy cover. Three little wooden guys smiling at the reader. I think these are meant to be creepy in some strange way, but I can't look at this one on the left without thinking of Butters from South Park. Jack is a pizzeria owner. He wants to be a big entrepreneur, and figured that purchasing the old pizza playground and revamping it would be the perfect approach to bring in new customers. It's not. Jack, by proxy, is always very angry and stressed, mainly about money, taking his frustration out in his wife, son, and employees. Now, for some reason, just as much focus is put on two of said employees, Porter and Siege. Siege is writing a book called The Puppet Carver, about a little wooden boy who comes to life, only without the ability to feel what he touches, eventually gaining that power after experiencing some unimaginable pain, and realizes that's what living truly is. That's like a parallel, but we'll get into it in a bit. Meanwhile, Porter is making a machine named after Siege's book, The Puppet Carver, which he thinks will be the new big cost-effective invention in animatronic technology. You put a plank of wood in the machine, and it comes out as a simple wooden animatronic, which you then can put a suit over. After Jack rages big time and fires all his employees, he's left alone in the pizzeria, where he hears a noise coming from Porter's machine. And after going inside it and having a near-death experience, he gains a completely new outlook on life, which everybody is quick to notice. Whoa, it's almost like he's a new man. These books aren't very subtle, are they? There's this bizarre moment later on where he's trying to get a small gift for his wife, and on the way to get it, he hears footsteps behind him, before being confronted by this giant pink squishy creature that I'm pretty sure is made out of fucking faz goo, given its organs and shit. You couldn't leave that alone, could we? But I'm not sure what this moment really adds to the story. The creature simply touches Jack and makes him experience all the pain he's given to people, before disappearing so he can go apologize to his wife. But, like, he already regretted the way he was acting. Did he really need to have it happen again? Who knows, at this rate, I'm starting to become more and more attentive as to what I think is going to end up returning in the epilogues. So I figure it's just going to be something like that, considering the FNAF 3 story, where touching Springtrap evoked past memories, which was then followed up in the epilogue with Jake doing just that. Anyways, Jack rehires all his employees, tells his wife the truth about his financial situation, and brings in new ideas to the business that actually work. Huzzah! The story ends with Siege finishing his novel and walking over to Porter's machine where he smells something funny, and upon opening it sees blood and guts everywhere, which he pours out into the garbage not questioning a thing. I know I said these books were predictable, but it actually took me a minute to realize here that the reason why Jack was acting so nice now wasn't because of his near-death experience, but instead because he went in the machine and came out the other end as a new version of himself, just like the planks of woods turning into animatronics. Wasn't expecting it, but I actually liked Puppet Carver quite a bit. Solid start to the book. Got a good twist, and I enjoyed that there wasn't a general bad guy, which is rare. You know, unless you want to count Fazgu, which I don't. Next up is Jump for Tickets. We get the best first impression possible, with the introduction of our main character, Colton, playing an RPG in his computer and calling kids squeakers like he's making a Minecraft trolling video. Did you know? 
Colton's dad is dead. Since then, he's become this bitter kid, who's pissed off that his family are no longer able to afford nice things, trying his hardest to win enough tickets at Freddy Fazbear's so he can win a handheld console. He has the genius plan of breaking into Freddy's at night and rigging one of the machines. The one where you have to jump on the metal floor to have tickets fall from the top, and see how many you can collect. Only issue is Coil's the birthday clown, who has these long, coiled arms that keep grabbing at him. There's not much to say here, it's very simple, and I don't think having it come right after the puppet carver was a smart idea, honestly. The story ends with Carlton getting trapped under the machine all night, with kids coming in as the place opens and jumping on it, crushing him. All that for a DSi. The getting trapped in a small machine and dying was literally done in the last story, and that one had way more going on. Jump for tickets isn't bad or anything, but considering we're now nine books in, it's hard not to find it incredibly bland and forgettable. That's all I have to say. Our last story is Pizza Kit, and unfortunately, I don't have a ton to say about this one either. It's like three different stories we've seen before combined into one. Pizza Kit is like the new kid, To Be Beautiful and Blackbird all mixed into one. Peyton and Marley are going to the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Kit factory for their home ec class, with Peyton being the smart and less outgoing one, and Marley being the popular pretty girl, who quickly gets bored and wants to leave the group to explore on her own. They drive home the fact that Marley is a bad influence on Peyton, with even Peyton abandoning her once best friend Abigail just to befriend her. After fucking around in the factory, an incident results in Marley falling into a vat of pizza sauce with Peyton lying and saying she has no idea what happened to her. From here, things just get fucking crazy. The school receives their pizza kits, and Peyton quickly realizes that hers is made out of the blood and skin of her friend, forcing herself to eat it so she doesn't look suspicious. Then, when she goes home, she has very bad pains in her stomach, feeling like something is crawling around her and expanding her skin. Yeah, that that's what we were missing in Flation. She goes in the mirror and sees Marley's hand trying to reach out of her mouth in which she vomits up all of her friend's body parts in a bush outside. Then after going back inside and hearing Marley ring the doorbell, she decides to hide on the roof. We then fucking switch to Marley's perspective. Turns out she was just being a silly billy and hiding in the factory the whole time. She walks around to the side of Peyton's house, only to find her laying on the ground with a snapped neck. She fell off the roof. Is that really the fucking big scary conclusion here? The scariest thing about Pizza Kit was how often the writer fucked up on who is who, with there being times where Peyton was incorrectly called Marley. Hell, even on the blurb it says, Marley's best friend goes missing. Yeah, sure, that's what happened. So, what happened at the start then? Turns out Marley didn't fall into pizza sauce, I guess? Despite all the thuds and screaming? It feels like the twist was thought up last minute with no regard as to how much this contradicts the story. Initially, I had thought that maybe when she vomited up Marley that it made, like, a new version of her or some shit, which would be equally dumb, by the way, but not out of the ordinary for this series. But we didn't even get Yo, that, it was just, just a, a prank, prank, I guess. I don't know, man, I'm getting sick of all these stories where they keep building and building on an idea, only for it to be implied that the character was just hallucinating the whole time. It's getting rather steel and annoying. Maybe it's just because we're getting so far into these, but The Puppet Carver has got to be the most forgettable book yet. Not the worst, don't get me wrong on that, even if I don't really like Pizza Kit. But I don't know, a year from now, I'm gonna remember in the flesh. That memory will sadly probably go with me to my grave. But am I really gonna think about Jump for Tickets in the future? I think we know the answer to that. What doesn't help is how pitifully short this epilogue is. These things were getting to be like 20 pages, but this one is like 7. Larson is at his desk, next to a new cop Chansey, who they put a lot of focus on suddenly, I'm sure he's gonna come back. Before Larson gets the blood tests back from the lab, which informs him that whatever blood was in that ball pit was taken from different decades in time. Obviously being because it's like a time portal or whatever, saying that out loud reminds me of how dumb this all is. Jake is also still helping the girl from before, her name being Ronell, which Jake doesn't believe to be the truth. He learns that her mother died, of course, and got kicked out by her dad, before ending on Jake finally happy and believing something good is gonna happen. Get the laugh track ready, because I can only assume that's gonna be short-lived. Okay, this now takes the cake for the most freakish cover yet. What the fuck is this thing? I could have never predicted what this plot was gonna be just from looking at this, so let's just get into it. Friendly Face stars Edward with his best friend Jack. Edward is quickly set up to be this big klutz who needs to pay more attention. Pay more attention, Edward, because you never know when Freddy Fazbear is gonna rear his ugly head. Sorry for calling you ugly, Freddy. The friends find a kitten, whom they name Faraday. Named after some guy I can't remember, who cares, because 20 or so pages later... Ryan, look out! This fucking truck hits not only the cat, but Jack, too, sending Edward into this ultra-depressive state not leaving his bed for weeks on end. 
They do that thing where he's watching TV at the exact right time to get a commercial for a product that just so happens to cater to his current situation. Being an ad of Freddy Fazbear letting you know about this brand spanking new thing they have, where you can send in your pet's DNA, in which they'll send you back an animatronic version. What are the odds? Okay, so an issue I'm starting to see with them trying to branch out more is that they still want to involve Fazbear Entertainment in some way. But because of that, they turned what was initially a little small pizza chain restaurant into this giant mega corporation with state of the art technology, with custom pizza factories and science kits. Can't forget the Fazgo. And I don't know, it takes me out of it at times. Freddy's can just be anything the writer wants at this point. Anyways, he runs to the place that died, collects some DNA, and sends it in. But oh no, when it's sent back, it's revealed that Edward accidentally sent in Jack's hair instead of the cat's. Whoa-oh. So he now has an animatronic animal with the face of his deceased best friend. Whoops. Should have been more careful, Edward. I like where they go with this. He can't believe what he did and tries to hide the evidence. And I don't even mind the retread of Blackbird here. With him seeing the robot everywhere he looks. He gets so stressed out of it following him that he runs away, and not paying attention, he too gets hit by a truck. Perfect car wrecks for everyone. Okay, so ignoring this was the exact same ending as Step Closer with the Yarg Foxy thing, I actually enjoyed the reveal that the cat wasn't even evil. It just thought they were playing. Edward's demise came as a result of the guilt he felt for what he had done. So in the end, Friendly Face was decent, solid story. Sadly, the same cannot be said for sea bonnies. Yes, it's exactly what you think. Mott, what kind of fucking name is Mott, is annoyed that his little brother Rory has gotten these strange sea monkeys from Freddy's, except they've been genetically engineered to look like tiny little bu- See what I mean? What shitty low-tier pizza chain is going out of their way to genetically engineer fucking sea monkeys? It's so outlandish. What follows are the creatures continuously insulting Mott and getting in his head, throwing such offensive insults at him like, Scaredy Cat. Damn, Mott, you need some ice for those burns? Things progress more and more, when he finds out that the Bonnies have attacked the goldfish they share a tank with. Having gone inside it and eaten it out, fuck, I mean, e eaten it from inside out, there we go. After hastily flushing the things down the toilet, he drinks some water. But wait a minute, that water felt a little funny. Yep, we got another eating something that upsets the main character's tummy story. How many is that now? Three? And the previous one was like two stories ago. He feels himself being eaten from the inside. Stuff is crawling around his skin and tormenting him wherever he goes. Before one night he's completely absorbed by the things. His flesh is gone and replaced by sea bonnies. Until they take over him entirely. Great. I think my main issue with sea bonnies, other than the ending we've seen too many times at this point, is how it blows its load way too early. All of the stories in this book are over 80 pages, and I have to wonder why, because this idea does not warrant being that long, or at least in the way they went to bite it. After he swallows the thing, it's followed by page after page just giving you the same information, going back and forth from the doctors with nothing being done. The impact of his flesh being taken over by bonnies is nullified, not only because they draw it out for so long, but because they spoil it with going into detail about what happened to the fish. That would be fine as a setup if the ending weren't so drawn out. You've already told us what's gonna happen, so the surprise is all gone, we just wanna see it happen at this point. And for that, Sea Bonnies is without a doubt one of my least favorites so far. I can only hope Together Forever brings this book back up, because so far, pretty weak. Jessica and Brittany are the most epic and popular girls in school. They've got sweet boyfriends, and Jessica's even voted prom queen or some shit, despite not even being in that grid. Everything's going great for them, except for one thing. Well, more like two things. Mindy and Cindy. There are these two annoying girls who transfer a year up in the school for their robotic skills, and keep getting in the way of Jessica and Brittany. They keep trying to insult the girls, but they never seem to be affected at whatever they throw, even claiming that the two bitches are simply projecting how they feel about themselves. Luckily enough, they've got a chance for revenge, when their robotics class are all given old broken Freddy's animatronics, to fix up as an assignment. Jessica and Brittany get Rosie, this pig animatronic who seems to have an opening in its stomach, featuring some familiar spring locks. This is their chance. They're gonna program it to grab Mindy and Cindy and shove them inside as a funny prank. The opposite happens. How this was one of the longest stories in the series baffles me. I have nothing to say about Together Forever. It, it takes a simple idea and drags out for eternity. And the horror doesn't even save it, because we've already seen a kid be killed by the Springlock suits back in the new kid, so it isn't even new grind. The one thing I can give it is the descriptive language they use when describing what the girl's mangled corpse looked like in there with their blank, severed faces staring at each other for all eternity. But that one line at the very end doesn't see if how utterly bored I was throughout this thing. 
fuck you. Sorry, I've got nothing. Our epilogue sees Larson trying to track down not only the previous folks who owned the pizza place, but also what murders happened around the same time the blood samples are from, with the help of Chansey, who he's still not crazy about. He not only finds a photo of Eleanor from the To Be Beautiful story, but even a report from a man named Dr. Talbert, who studied Remnant, revealing it to be this bubbling liquid mercury, although nobody ever managed to get a sample. He realizes all he can do now is try and locate the Stitchrith, who's actually managed to find Rennell's father, who it turns out was Dr. Talbert. But wait a minute, she doesn't look like the girl in the pictures. She doesn't look anything like the girl in the pictures. Larson approaches the same house, seeing Rennell quickly turn into the same girl from the photos. It turns out that the whole time, Rennell was Eleanor. Whoa. It's implied that Eleanor was present for all the victims in the Fazbear Frights books, being around when they met their demise. But while this is going on, Dr. Talbert reunites with what he thinks is his daughter. Jake attacks her, but the doctor shoots him. He's going to give the not Rennell some remnant to heal her wounds, not realizing that's exactly what Eleanor wants. Okay, I'll, I'll admit I've been roped back in. I find it odd that Eleanor was the big bad guy these books have been building up to, given her whatever introduction, but the idea that she's been the mastermind behind all these stories, or at least most of them, is a really cool idea. I wonder where they're gonna go with this in. I'm joking! Stop! 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 Well, here we are. The last proper book in the Fazbear Fright Saga. I know we've got another book to check out, but that's treated more like a bonus thing. Like I said, you can only get it for purchasing the big collector's box. I feel like I need to reiterate that because sometimes I forget that because of the sheer length of this project. I last mentioned that like two hours ago, so maybe you forgot. The cover here sucks. It's an awful way to go out. I like the idea behind it, a lone guy wordly walking through a hallway with mysterious creatures to his left and right, but it's brought down entirely by the bad artwork. This is the Five Nights at Freddy's fan base. It seriously can't be that hard to find a decent artist. Our first last story, Prankster, stars Jeremiah. He's working at a game development studio that was recently bought out by Fazbear Entertainment, who wants them to work on their brand new VR game. Oh shit, I was not expecting a Help Wanted story. At first, I felt like this wouldn't have much in relation to the game given the first 30 or so pages instead being this pretty focused story of Jeremiah trying to win over the only girl in the studio, Hope, having an unspoken competition with another employee, Parker. Jeremiah is like the opposite of our other game developer guy from the Baby Springtrap story. This guy is a complete simp, he's always trying to tell her jokes but feels each and every time, she laughs along when Parker fucks around with him, and his big attempt to win her over is to try and be as nice as possible. When will you learn, Jeremiah? Nice guys finish last. One day he decides to go home early, while Hope and Parker test out the game, being afraid that they're gonna end up fucking in his absence. What's even worse is tomorrow is his birthday! He goes into the office and sees a big banner placed on the wall, but no one is around. A voice from a speaker tells him that they're gonna play a little game to find his friends. He has 30 minutes to look for them, or else something bad's gonna happen. It's like a saw trap or some shit. When he eventually gets to the end, he finds a VCR, and after turning it on sees a video of the two of them, laughing maniacally amongst a room full of knives, before he's directed towards a closet which is beginning to open. Th th that's where it ends. It's up for interpretation, but I personally think what happened here is that when the two of them were testing out the game, they got infected by the glitch trap, which is like, code William Afton if I remember correctly. But it forced them to cut themselves up, now being after Jeremiah, killing him. I was really surprised it wasn't a more direct adaptation of Help Wanted, given the girl on the tapes in that game referring to a fellow developer, Jeremy, who had been acting differently after testing the game before killing himself, but either way, I enjoyed Prankster a good bit. My biggest issue with it is the length being the shortest story yet at only around 45 pages. Unlike others, I feel like there was a lot more here that could have been explored, or at least expand upon his race to find them in time. It's just sort of, go to this room, immediately solves puzzle, go to the next room, immediately solves puzzle. Feels like they're rushing a bit. And given the fact that the next two stories are around 80 pages, I can only hope that they had a reason for keeping Prankster so short. But still, I enjoyed it well enough. Kids at Play is next on the list, featuring Joel. He's a fucking asshole. He's this 18 year old who's got a pretty sweet life. His dad lets him work at his gardening store at above the regular wage, buys him a car, giving him a free ride basically. But he's such an entitled shithead. He gets fired for consistently leaving work early and then just whines for his job back which works. He complains that his mom doesn't cook enough breakfast for him. He wants no binderies. Even his friends call him out in his shit to no avail. Things take a turn however when one day he runs over a kids at play sign, warning you not to speed on the road as there's... Well, kids at play. Later that night, he evidently ignores that sign's wishes as he fucking hits a kid into a ditch, fleeing from the scene of the crime. 
From here I dropped off. It's yet another guilt trip story, where he simply starts to see the sign everywhere he goes, his guilt rising more and more as the whole time starts searching for the boy to no avail. The ending is kinda cool, I guess, where he's lifted from his bed and walks all the way to where the body is late at night to face what he did. I can only imagine this works like the one Spongebob episode. And the story ends with his body parts falling off. His eyes, his hair, his hands, everything. Only for folks to hear crying from the ditch as they find the young boy, A-OK -okay, apparently, laying beside the very same kids at Plus Sign. Well that's lame. I mean, I love the horror element to this one. The whole guilt angle is done really well, I thoroughly enjoyed all that stuff. As well as the descriptive text at the end detailing what's happening to his body. But for that to be the ending after already retreading the same sort of middle act as Blackbird and the cat one? It's, it's a weird way to go out, honestly. You'd think they'd want to go guns ablaze and considering it's the final-ish book, but alas. Finally, we have Find Player 2, starring Annie, the quiet girl, and her good friend Miri Jo, the more crazy one. I really enjoyed it. They play in the hiding mirrors at Freddy's, which is only designed for two people at a time, with the hider having two-way mirrors around the tube system so they can watch the seeker as they try to catch them. Although they notice that as they're playing, there's this creepy guy watching them. Huh. After getting scared by him and leaving the game early, we cut to ten years later. Apparently he kidnapped Miri Joe, and Amy has been ridden with guilt ever since, and so she's finally gonna go and confront him. Turns out he was nothing more than a red herring though, he was simply looking for his daughter, and so Amy decides she's gonna go back to where Freddy's was to find some clues. From here she goes in the back to find that is still intact, and after entering sees that the game was still in play, meaning Miri Joe had been locked in there for ten whole years, being nothing more than a mummified corpse. Amy now meeting the exact same fate. Okay, so ignoring the idea that after she went home from Freddy's that day, not only did Mary Jo's foster parents apparently not look for her, or ask Amy where they last saw her, not only did Freddy's apparently close down the second she left, leaving everything abandoned, but also, nobody ever decided to check inside the tubes for 10 years, despite there clearly still being a game in play? So like, wh why wouldn't somebody have gone in to see what's up? Despite all that, I still liked it well enough and felt it to be a satisfactory final story, sorta. They built up to it well, but much like Kids at Play, I don't see why it needed to be so much longer than Prankster. That was the one I felt like had the most room, but whatever. Sorry again that I don't have a lot to say here. It's mostly because the more we go on, the more repetitive they're all getting. But just know that it's good. Our final epilogue. What happens to Larson and Jake? Do they defeat Eleanor? I don't know, I haven't read it yet. Right off the bat, I was super confused. Jake is in a dream made up of false memories and Larson is in some field somewhere. He goes to Freddy Fazbear's to find the ball pit portal so he can get back to reality. He jumps in and winds up near a junkyard. He opens the truck of the car only for Eleanor to lunge ah! out at him. He has the idea to throw her in the trash compactor before waking up right where he left off. He keeps going through different time periods, repeating the events again and again of fighting Eleanor and going into the ball pit. Meanwhile, Jake is fighting present-day Eleanor. They're fusing into each other just like how Jake was with Andrew. He defeats her in an honestly pretty anticlimactic way, and Larson reunites with his son, spending more time with him. Jake goes back to the pizzeria with the spirit of Eleanor leading him there. He sinks lower and lower into the pit, being put to rest. We cut to someone called Millie, who goes back into her house to hug her grandfather on Christmas. W wait a minute. That's fucking Millie from back in the first book, the one who was crushed by Funtime Freddy. I guess Jake is giving all the agony-filled spirits a happy memory to latch onto, a, a happiest day. It ends with Larson going back to Dr. Talbert, asking what Remnant really is, who claims it's like mixing the tangible with the intangible, handing Larson a pendant he made to help his daughter when she was sick. And... Oh wait, that's it. The fuck? Okay, so aside from that pretty weak ending, feels like it wrapped itself up way too quickly, I figured I'd give some insight as to what I'm pretty sure is going on here. So... After consulting some FNAF fans for their opinions on this because by god I would not have picked up on it, it seems like the main antagonist of this whole Fazbear Fright saga was this evil presence, and no it wasn't Eleanor. It seems like it's instead this thing that fans have dubbed The Shadow. I've also heard it's been referred to as Dark Remnant since it's pretty much the opposite of it. The whole theme here is about Legacy, which is the exact inversion of Remnant. Remnant is your own memories and emotions, while legacy is the memory others have of you, and the emotion that your name evokes in others. Your legacy can linger. It outlives you, and therefore, can influence others. The William Afton amalgamation was him, but not quite. It was more so the memory of him, his soul trying one last attempt to regain power, the embodiment of his evil, which is so sinister that it can infect other people, which is why Jake had to suck it out of Larson. 
The ball pit represents the energy of all of Afton's dark remnant, you know, his legacy. Its tethering souls inside of it is one singular entity, creating such a strong energy that it can influence other entities or souls with the same evil that powered his spirit, which explains all the supernatural shit going on in Fazbear Frights, you know, they were infected. Jake was able to withstand all this because he was composed of good memories and emotion. They give him strength over the negative ones that were powering Eleanor. Agony is another important aspect. The idea of having the same intention is what caused you to suffer. Like Andrew, for example, killing the garbage men, you know, they're continuing Afton's legacy of murder. The Spring Bonnie from all the way back in the first story, Into the Pit, wasn't really William Afton. It's a reflection of his legacy, it's the memory of him. Oswald is experiencing a memory so strong that it feels like he was really there. There was no actual time traveling going Going on. They were all just experiencing super real memories. The reason why all the victims' souls from the other stories ended up in the ball pit is because it's the last remaining thing from the restaurant, the only memory of it. That was the Freddy's location where it all started, where Afton murdered those kids. Did any of that make sense? By god I hope so. I will say, I do still miss the realness of William Afton just being a guy, you know, a child murderer. He's way scarier that way to me. But I can't lie and say if they want to lean more into these sci-fi elements, then this was a pretty interesting way to go about it. I was really glad that they added this whole epilogue to the series. Not only does it give us greater insight for all the supernatural shit going on in the franchise now, well, okay, it gives you greater insight if you're willing to read it all 20 times and read between the lines, but still. I think it ties everything together well. Was without a doubt my favorite aspect of this whole Fazbear Frights detour. Either way, it's time to cover the final book in the series, the one consisting of three stories that were made for different books, but wind up getting cut. Were they scrapped for a reason? Let's see. I like the cover for Felix the Shark. May come off a little dumb, but for a bonus book filled with extra stories, I don't mind it being a little stupid. I think I even made an offhand joke about a shark matronic in my original video back in 2020, so I guess we've come full circle. Felix the Shark sees Dirk. He's telling his only friends how he wants to start up a Freddy Fazbear Club, so that people can get together and discuss their memories of the place. He's even found his old Felix plush to go along with it. But that's strange. Seems like nobody else remembers there being a shark. They especially don't remember being able to swim in the tank with it like he's saying he did. Right off the bat this had me hooked. That's a great idea for one of these stories. Just what did he see back in the day? He sets out on a journey to find his Freddies from his childhood, in which he learns about why this specific restaurant had an addition to its cast. Apparently the owner of it had a son who drowned one day, being pushed ashore by a shark, and so to pay his respects, or grieve I guess, he added a shark animatronic in memory of his lost son. There's a lot of drawn out mystery stuff in between these reveals by the way, this is an 80 page story, so it's not like Prankster where they skimp out on the second act, and have the protagonist speed run getting to his destination. He visits diners, meets up with the owner's daughter at one point, who gives him a pendant that when taken to the place where Freddy's used to be, reveals the remains of the old restaurant. Dirk hops inside and finds it. He wasn't crazy. Felix's tank is here. But no Felix. Strange. Well. Guess there's only one thing left to do, and hop inside the fucking tank with him? That sure sounds like a solid plan. He gets in the tank and quickly realizes he can't get out. Whoa! He forgot that someone from the outside had to open it. <laughs> what a silly mistake. So there he remains, spinning around in a tank with the very thing he sought after. Nobody even knowing he find it. I enjoyed Felix the Shark, but it wasn't perfect. Some of the foreshadowing is way too on the nose. He realizes that the owner's daughter was the author of some book that he really liked, the book containing more clues for finding Freddy's, and they keep referring to this story of a man going on a great hunt to find something, but when he does it causes his own demise. I don't see why they needed to so blatantly spoil the ending, but hey, who cares, it was scrapped. Still though, I don't really see why it was cut. Honestly, I'd say it's of a higher quality than like half the stories that made it to release, but whatever, they must have their reasons. Let's just move on to the scoop. I really hated our main character here. I, I, I sympathize for her just as much as I despise her, and a big reason for that has to be with how meta this story is, more than any other in the series. Mandy is bullied at her private school for being a freak, which you know is sad and all, I wouldn't wish that upon any kid, but like, she's writing Five Nights at Freddy's fanfiction in class, of course people are going to make fun of her. She spends her time playing FNAF 3 on her phone and goes on FNAF forums to look at posts about real life cases of missing children, trying to fit them into the FNAF lore like a psycho. They reference game theory like twice by the way, I'm telling you, this shit's meta. 
She decompiles FNAF 3 in her computer and finds an image of a movie theater. And after eventually finding out that it's a place in Utah, she not only realizes that's exactly where her mother is going on a business trip, but her online friend Lindy also lives there. So they go to see why it was in the game's files. Oh yeah, she also sees, like, uh, the ghost of a little boy. I felt like that was worth mentioning. From here, it's pretty standard, although I don't see why Lindy was introduced. They meet up once, and when the big climax happens to Mandy, she's not even there anymore. I guess it's more so for the character, throwing her a bone and letting her relate to someone for a bit because of how she's treated at school. I liked all that stuff, her feeling isolated and lonely. I think she's also implied to be autistic in some way, considering her not being able to keep still and having fixations on Freddy stuff, but who knows. Where it kind of gets weird to me is when she goes to the theater and learns that a kid went missing there. The same one from the form she read about. And the same ghost that she's been seeing around the place. And so she wants to go back in, not only to investigate, but somehow to tie it into the Freddy's lore. I, I did not like that stuff at all, because it's, the, it's that Matt Pat shit. You know when he made his first FNAF video and tried to say that the game was one big nod to a real murder that happened at a Chuck E. Cheese? Seems a little insensitive, and it's the same thing here. Lindy even has to tell her this is real people, not some video game, you know, treat it with fucking respect. Because of stuff like that, it makes me want to see Mandy die. Not because I don't like her, but because it's more of a cautionary deal, you know? Don't fuck around and think this is some light shit just because it's related to a Five Nights at Freddy's video game. Despite what you think it's building up to, Mandy goes in the back and finds an animatronic bear suit, and inside there's the corpse of the missing boy. The police are called in and she's a hero. Perfect. Remember, kids, take these serious matters into your own hands. Who knows? It may be connected to Five Nights at Freddy's. Still, though, I like the scoop. The self-awareness didn't get in the way of me caring about the main character, and being happy that she got a nice ending. So let's end off the Fazbear Fright Saga with our final story, You're the Band. Sylvia is starting to question her son Timmy's obsession with Freddy Fazbear's. Those restaurants shut down like 30 years ago. Why is he hearing about this? Damn it. It must be those dang game theorists. That is not a lie, that's really hard to explain this. Sylvia is a bad mother, I'm just gonna say it. Not in that she's abusive or whatever, but she constantly talks about how worried she is about this obsession of his, but does nothing to stop it. She enables it, if anything. Not once is she ever like, look shithead, the Freddy's needs to stop. Or like, make sure he's not watching shit about child murder online, like Jesus Christ, he's eight years old. Nah, in instead of this, she throws him a Freddy's themed birthday party and buys him an authentic Freddy mask from the internet. But ever since then, Timmy's been acting strange. It's like there's two people inside of him. Sometimes he'll talk about being there for the murders, or be impressed by the technology of today. There seems to also be this shadow creature too that lures him back to the original Freddy's location. A man eventually grabs Sylvia and lets her know that he's Mike, a security guard for the Freddy's. Pretty sure this is a book version of Mike Schmidt, the character you play as in FNAF 1, but it's not confirmed. Either way, they go to Freddy's, find Timmy listening to the animatronic singing, in which Mike uses the Freddy head to lure in none other than the puppet, who takes it back and Freddy's restored. Oh, okay, it wasn't a Freddy mask, it was Freddy's head. That's why there were two people inside Timmy, it was the souls of one of the kids William Afton killed, that makes sense. I like this one too, what the fuck, why were all these stories cut? I think it was the only book in all of Fazbear Frights where I thoroughly enjoyed each and every story. And it couldn't have been to make room for more lore stories, because in the final epilogue with Larson and Eleanor, I'm pretty sure this Timmy story was referenced and made no sense. I'm glad these managed to come out eventually either way. I'd recommend checking this one out over a lot of the others. But still, we're done with Fazbear Frights. What a mixed bag. I like the idea behind these stories a lot, and there's a bunch of ones that execute on that well. Gives us more to see and experience in this universe not seen in the games. But I think more effort should have been put maybe into making sure stories don't retread on similar themes and story beats. Or maybe limit some of the creativity, because this shit got off the walls at times. But hey, we're not exactly done with Fazbear Frights just yet. What could I possibly mean? Let's see. Because apparently we needed one of these. Back at the start of the year, we saw the first release of the new Fazbear Frights graphic novel collection. Yep, you know what that means. We're gonna be getting retellings of just about every single story in the series. Well, I think they are. They're very pick and choosy with these, so I have no idea if they're doing all of them or just select highlights like a best of of some sort. Although if they are, I have to wonder what the criteria is for what warrants being turned into a graphic novel. Perhaps it's whatever one fits into the ongoing epilogue. Spoiler warning, they don't have that here. But maybe they're gonna do it at the very end. And so we're only covering the books that build up to that. You know, Into the Pit setting up Spring Bonnie, To Be Beautiful showing us the Sarah trash, 
an out of stock having the plus trap chaser. If you remember, these are all things brought back in the epilogues. But then I have to wonder why they skipped over fetch, which they're apparently going to cover in the second volume. It's just a bit bizarre to me, I guess, that the first volume of this would cover what's pretty much story 1, 2, and then straight to 6, but hey, what are you going to do? I love the cover here, showing us a detailed drawing of the plush trap cheeser lunging out through a door, eating it with his sharp human looking teeth. Boy, I sure do hope the story lives up to the hype. Okay, so there is no hiding or getting around it. Into the pit looks like trash, bottom of the barrel deviant art bases and all. Again, I need to say it profusely, but I have nothing against the artist here. I'm sure the deadline was tight, but what is this? Who's hiring these people, Scott or Scholastic? Because with the franchise worth over $70 million, I have to wonder why they can't even use a portion of that to get good art. The dad straight up just looks like Mr. Enter. And instead of being this weird, kind of grimy and mysterious rundown pizza restaurant owner, Jeff is just... Well, he's just a grey version of Oswald's dad. They cut out a lot here too, only keeping the essentials. They remove a lot of the exposition at the start, for the town became so shitty with everyone losing their jobs. But Oswald says, It's hard to say no to a warm, gooey slice. So I guess that makes up for it. Much like the Silver Eyes graphic novel, a large issue here is how this art ruins so much of the tension, in a story that already wasn't the best. Glad to see that Spring Bonnie's death is just as hilarious and pathetic as I imagined it to be. Seriously though, who is at fault here? Again, is it Scholastic? Because these are little baby books, do they not want things to look too creepy or adult in case parents don't want to give their kids money to buy it at the book fair? No matter what, it doesn't help that the art here is just bad, it's so lifeless. They don't even attempt to sell the whole 80s look when Oswald time travels, it's just a white room. I don't understand the point of any of this if you're gonna half-ass it so much. Shouldn't the appeal of these be that they're bringing the stories to life in a way? I don't know, that's a repeated theme with the next two as well, so I'll quickly go over some stuff I noticed and we can move on from this shit. To Be Beautiful has a slightly better art style, but it's still very rough. I absolutely hate Eleanor's design here, it's so similar to Baby, but I don't think there's any correlation between the two. So it's just this weird freakish Baby lookalike, that's way uglier with its worm neck and long arms and legs. Why would someone want to get rid of such a beautiful, perfect object? I, I guess that's subjective, isn't it? I know I'm being very harsh here, harsher than I think I was to any other book in this whole video, but you have to understand there was a whole seven years between the first FNAF book and this one. Three years between this and the first graphic novel. He has had years to get this formula right, build a rapport with talented artists, and with the fourth closet graphic novel it felt like he learned just that. But now we're back to this shit, I don't understand. You want me to show you the funniest thing about all this though? The part that made me have to stop and burst out laughing at the incompetence while I was reading? At page 108, the guy that Sarah likes comes over to talk to her. When she was uglier in the story, she knocked her lunch into them, which pissed him off because she was so ugly. But now that she's pretty, he wants to try and get with her. L let me just read this panel to you. Oh, hi. You know, I don't think our conversation the other day ended how I would have liked. N n no? That made the characters say each other's lines that fucked up on the text boxes. How do you do that? It's shit like this that makes it hard for me to defend these. See them as anything other than a cheap way to make some money by recycling already written stories. Nothing, nothing could get worse than that. Please, it was rhetorical. I appreciate the vastly different style they're going for with Out of Stock. Something super sketchy and rough, and in some cases, okay, in a couple cases, it manages to succeed at what it's trying to do. But it just so happens that those couple cases are outweighed by the bazillion other cases where it feels hard and looks like dog shit. Most of the time this comes off like bad AI artwork, like here, where a main character's hand is just fusing with his face. Or the final page, which is a heartfelt reconciliation with his mother, but his eyes are two vastly different sizes. This shit is like, inexcusable honestly, there is no way that anybody should have looked at this and went, sweet, print it! But I can understand what they were at least going for. If anything, I'll take this over the first two art styles any day of the week. I think it's meant to be more experimental, very wild and hectic and off-model to sell that helplessness with the kids. In the dark, it probably would have been hard to get a good look at this thing, so maybe it's trying to lean into that more. And in certain cases, mostly with close-ups, I feel like they do an excellent job with it. The dark red eyes and realistic teeth reminds me of one of those Sonic.exe drawings, which, hey, works better than this shit at least. But when they fuck up, they really fuck up. And in most examples of them drawing the plush trap, 
He just looks silly, giving him tiny dot eyes and a goofy little smile. I don't know why it's meant to be intimidating, especially with its bib, I'm not even sure if it were even described to have that in the story. So at the end of the day, this is the best adaptation in the whole thing, but it's still pretty shit. I wish I could say I'm hopeful for volume 2, but I highly doubt it's gonna be an improvement, given the sneak peek we got at Fetch, which is using the same artist as Into the Pit. Way to go, he certainly needed that story ruined too. Safe to say I don't plan on keeping up with these volumes given the track record they're setting, but at least we only had one to cover for this video. It means we can move on to the final segment, the two currently released books in the brand new series, Teals from the Pizza Plex. It's just Fazbear Frights again. In 2022, we got the first in a series of books that aim to stick to the formula of what Fazbear Frights established, three mini stories in one package, except based off the, at the time of writing this, most recent game in the franchise, Security Breach. Now, we all know by now that Security Breach was an overambitious project, rushed to release and came out as an unfinished buggy mess. Go check out my whole video on that disaster for more context, but I'm not opposed at all to focusing the next batch of books on the Pizza Plex. I think most would agree that, while not necessarily scary in any way, the giant Five Nights at Freddy's Mall is a really cool location, and with how wide and open it was, there's gotta be a plethora of spooky ideas to explore. 12 books was more than enough for Fazbear Frights. This was probably the best evolution they could have had. So let's see what they do with- <laughs> The fuck is that thing? Um, I guess this is Lally? Probably the most bizarre thing to use to introduce us to this new series, but eh, my interest has been piqued, I suppose, so that's good. First of all, I'm very disappointed to see that in terms of production, there is no difference here from Fazbear Frights. The only difference is the logo, really, and I do like that between books they switch the color, but they have the same glitch effect on the opening pages, same formatting, except now for some reason, the table of contents looks much cheaper because of the font they use. Even the blurb is the exact same. Security Breach was very colorful and flashy, you know, 80s inspired, so I'm surprised to see they didn't lean into that more. Okay, well, less surprised and more disappointed. I understand it must have been way easier to reuse the already done shit, rather than hire a designer to make a new one, but alas. Our first story is, shockingly, not Lally's game. Breaking the trend of the title and cover being the first heel, it, it, it's ruined! Instead, we start with Frailty, a story that has nothing to do with the Pizza Plex. Wonderful way to begin. I'm joking, of course, I actually liked this opener. It wasn't bad at all, even if it leaves you with more questions than answers. We follow a girl named Jessica working in a hospital. She's only 14, but she constantly reiterates how she feels like she has to do this. She has to help the people there, to make up for the big mistake that she made in the past that changed everything. Spoiler warning, we uh, never learn what that mistake is. Instead, much more focus is put on the idea of giving and taking. Jessica has this inner turmoil where she's accepted the idea of doing everything in service of righting a wrong for the rest of her life, but when she meets a new boy in her class, Robert, who takes a liking to her, she starts to wonder if maybe she can be a little self-indulgent at times. Obviously, this is going on throughout the whole story as different mysteries start to pile up, making you question who Jessica is and what she had done that was so bad. She scrapes off some silver sheavings on a necklace she wears onto patients in the hospital, which magically heals them. She randomly drops metal junk everywhere, and she even sleeps in the cemetery by herself. Once we get to the end, and she decides to go to the prom with Robert, choosing that over not helping a dying girl in the hospital April. But once they kiss, she gets grease all over him. He gets gross to the fuck out and tells her to piss off. And so she runs back to the hospital, dropping metal parts everywhere, and shaves off the rest of her necklace, killing her. I, I, I did not leave anything like right. that is really how they end this. In some ways, I wish they took more of an effort to explain this stuff and give payoffs for the elements they go into, but I don't think it hurts it in the end. I still had a great time with it, mostly due to, again, the focus for the most part is on the moral dilemma she's facing of whether or not she can do something for herself sometimes, knowing that she has to make up for some big mistake that she had made. But I still would have liked to see how she became a robot in the first place, but whatever. Frailty is a very strong start to the new series. Although, again, I kind of wish it had more to do with Freddy's beyond a throwaway I mentioned near the start. You know, considering it's the first one and all, but maybe the titular Lally's game will get into that more. Let's find out. Lally's game shows us Selena. She spends the first couple pages bragging nonstop about how amazing her life is, how all her friends have drama in their lives, but she's so cool and hot with her modeling job and a handsome fiancé kid. They're moving back to his hometown to live near his mother, in this big old countryside house they put a down payment on. Oh my god, Selena, I'm so jealous. Not. After a whole load of exposition, Selena decides to poke her nose into some of Kid's old childhood scrapbooks. He's been acting pretty sus ever since they got to the house and warned her to never open up this strange old trunk that he took with them. Something's gotta be up with that. She sees photos of him at the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Plex next to what is apparently his favorite game ever, Lally's Game, where there'd be this strange lifeless robot that kids could spend time and play with, kinda like Lonely Freddy from Fazbear Frights. That was until one day where there was an accident. Lally went missing in the place- oh, he's in the trunk. 
The best thing about this one is how much they play with the idea that you're being told a bunch of different stories from different folks. Keed claims that Lally escaped one day, after a hole was made in the wall, following him home and stalking him until he trapped the thing in the trunk. Whereas Keed's mother adds more to the story that paints him in a new light, talking about how protective and possessive Keed was over Lally, getting mad when he sees another kid playing with them, claiming the game is only for two. Things took a turn when said kid was killed soon after, and then Lally went missing. I like this, turns her perfect Keed into someone more untrustworthy, making Selena more and more on edge around him, especially given the fact that she's now starting to see Lally pop up around the house, stalking her. Despite the mother letting her know that Lally couldn't move on its own, it had to be moved by someone. After knocking out Kid, she tries to escape the house, but that isn't before Lally gets her. Now, the ending is pretty vague. I, I think it's implied that Kid was innocent the whole time, given his clear shock at what happened to Selena. She was, like, killed and shoved in the trunk, I guess. It wasn't him who killed the kid, it was Lally who did it. Apparently, they are capable of moving on their own, after all. After this, we skip ahead to Kid moving into a new house with his new fiance, once again hiding the trunk away never to be opened again. But like, just just throw the trunk into the river or something, or Indiana Jones that shit. I think perhaps they could have gone more into the fact that Kid was keeping the trunk around because he did still have some sort of attachment to Lally, not wanting to part without them. Gives him some kind of peace or whatever to know that Lally is always in his possession. That might have been what they were going for, but it's definitely not made clear enough. Still though, Lally's scheme was another solid one. Just wish certain things could have been paid off better. Like, Lally not being able to move by themselves is a scary realization to make her suspect Kid, but it wasn't him doing it, so... How was it moving? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know. Four Death Spookies. Let's just get into the last one, Under Construction. And oh boy, was this a clusterfuck. Maya is having her birthday at the Pizzaplex, with her friends Noelle and Jackson. Finally, we get to see characters in the location the book is named after. She's most excited to try out this new AR game, the one you're inside puts you in the most perfect birthday ever with all your loved ones cheering and clapping and giving you prezzies. Oh shit though, it's, it's under construction. <laughs> He said it! He said it! Well, they can just sneak in and use it anyway. They go in and she makes her birthday a wish, hoping this moment could never end. What could possibly go wrong? Cancer. That's what. We fast forward to a year since the Freddy's visit, and two major things have happened. Maya has had consistent migraines, and her grandmother has gotten cancer, eventually dying. This appears to be an epidemic. Everyone in her family is being killed from the disease, too close together to be a coincidence. Eventually, this starts spreading. Her friends, parents, her own parents, her sister, everyone on Earth is dying except for her. And what's worse is the planet seems to be being overrun by these strange mush jelly baby things. They're filling the streets and the worst part is, nobody seems to care. Jackson shows no real sorrow when burying his own mother, or when he himself eventually gets stricken with the illness. They do an excellent job at showing Maya's hopelessness, rushing around to everyone's houses, attempting to eat everyone in their life. The futility eventually overcoming her as she realizes the world is fucked, but she's still fine. The little mushy babies start to flood her house. She gets surrounded by them, drowning in jello. But despite all this, death never comes. She remains there, dormant, not being able to see or hear. That's a scary idea and all, but what the fuck was this story? Where did this tone shift come from? If you haven't caught on at this point, Maya never left the AR game. She was in it the whole time, which is why she was having migraines. It was from having the little no things on her head too long. And I have to assume that time moves differently in the game, years in game being minutes in our reality. See, they do a fine job at making you aware she's still in the game, with her seeing under construction signs everywhere she goes. But I think where it feels is making it clear how all these disparate elements connect. Why cancer? Why was that the subject of this Five Nights at Freddy's book? Did Maya get brain cancer from the broken machine? Is that why it started giving everybody in the AR simulation cancer? We're never told. I didn't pick up on it originally, but the purpose behind all the mush babies was that the simulation couldn't create new life forms. It had nothing to base them off, which is why they came out as featureless mannequins. But like, why did they start multiplying themselves? Why did they start overrunning the Earth? Considering when it was written, a part of me thought this was one big COVID analogy. You know, everyone getting sick, but not a lot of people taking it seriously. But no, I, I don't think that. I, I just think it's stupid. There's an idea here, somewhere. A good idea. Her getting trapped in the simulation is cool and horrifying. Again, they sell her feeling of hopelessness towards the end really well, I loved all that. But the cancer and the mush babies was just weird and not in a good way, it was more confusing than anything. Apparently the third book in the Pizzaplex series will feature a story showing a different character's point of view of the situation, seeing Maya get stuck in the machine. But it got delayed until December, so fuck me, I guess. This was a weird beginning to Tales from the Pizzaplex, mostly because it had almost nothing to do with said Pizzaplex. At least Fazbear Frights was vague enough to where it wasn't connecting itself to any singular game, but not this one. While I didn't think it was bad and actually quite liked the first two stories, I don't personally think it was the best way to start. Who knows, Fazbear Frights didn't have the strongest first impression either. So let's see what we're ending with in the last book of the video.
What the fuck is this cover? Is the trend with teals from the pizza plex gonna be an ugly, strange looking creature paired with a cryptic ass name that tells you nothing about it? Who the fuck cares? Cause this is the final book. And maybe it's just because I got this one from Target, but is it just me or are these books getting cheaper and cheaper? It feels so flimsy and there's a big hole in the side of the thing. I'd expect this from Walmart, but you Target? I was pleasantly surprised to see that our first story, Help Wanted, was a loose adaptation of the VR video game of the same name. If you remember that game, it's what kicked off the current idea of the Five Nights at Freddy's video games existing in universe, with a rogue indie developer making said games to discredit Fazbear Entertainment. In said game, you could find tapes all around the events that, if placed in a hidden area, would allow you to hear logs from one of the developers, giving you insight at some of the shitty mysteries revolving around Fazbear Entertainment. With there being a rumor that they were the ones who were responsible for the indie games, enlisting a small programmer to make them as a way to make light of what happened and discredit them, which is all but confirmed with this story. Steve works at a shitty gas station, working on crappy indie games in his free time while e-deeting some lady named Amanda. One day he's approached by a strange figure who asks him to make the games we were just talking about, Five Nights at Freddy's 1, 2, 3, and 4, wanting him to be sent off to a remote area to work on them, which he actually declines because it would mean leaving behind Amanda. That's actually pretty admirable, dude. So then soon after, a new girl called Victoria hits him up on Tinder and he blows off Amanda to go fuck her. Ah, true love. He suddenly wakes up in Victoria's house, where she informs him that it's been years since they've been married and had kids, with a car crash from a while ago causing his memory loss. And it just so happens that around this time, the strange man returns offering him the same job, which he takes because of his financial struggles. Hmm, I can't possibly tell where this is headed. Let's cut the shit and get right to it. Why did Fazbear Entertainment specifically need Steve so badly, rather than the other thousands of developers out there, to the point where they set up this massive elaborate scheme to trap him in a house with animatronics, only disguised to be like the family he always wanted. Yeah, like Victoria and his kids are robots. They're even doing that fucking illusion trickery thing at nighttime to give him night terrors, which is revealed to have been done so he can have inspiration for his game. That aspect was really lame to me. Like when his kid scares him and he's like, ah, yes, I shall put epic jump scares in my game. I'm like, yes, God, I'm sure that's how it happened. The best thing about this dumb twist is the ending, with Steve having a talk with someone on the outside, telling him that he can stay in this perfect life where nothing can go wrong. It's like the ending to The Truman Show, except Steve doesn't take the leap. He chooses to stay with this fake family and live out the rest of his days in complete and utter bliss. Wasn't expecting that choice, but I liked it a lot. The whole thing, as a matter of fact, was pretty alright. Don't have any real complaints here. Maybe we can end this whole thing on a bang. We then have the titular haps, and I have no idea how this became the face of the book because it's easily the worst one that I've got almost nothing to say about. Eden and his friend Jace are at the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Plex. They're like 15 years old and playing in the Freddy Fortress or something, which is just a maze that consists of a series of plastic tubes. Haps roams these things, cleaning and helping lost kids find their way out, with Haps standing for Helpful Automated Pipe Protection Server. And after Eden and Jace try to kick through a dead end, they fall with Haps down to this dark area, filled with two-way mirrors that allow them to see inside of the mall, but nobody can see them. What follows is a variety of chase scenes, where because they kick the shit out of him, Hap's arms are broken down to nothing more than sharp metal shards, and if he sees them, he's gonna want to grab them, which he then does to Jius and kills him. The whole thing doesn't even really have an ending, just stopping with Eden crawling around in a circle with Hap's right on his heel, never knowing when the madness will end. Again, that's all I gotta say, I don't care about Eden or Jius, they put themselves in this situation, and their method of trying to find a way out just consists of them crawling around endlessly. It's rather boring and not something I want to waste more time on. The final story of the video is B7 which sees a kid named Billy be so enthralled by the Freddy's animatronics that he starts to believe that he is one too. He takes this way too far. He goes a whole 16 or so years like this, as we follow small little glimpses at different stages of his life. I enjoyed B7 a ton, way more than I thought I would. Again, because it keeps switching years in the future, it always keeps your interest, as you want to see how keeping this up for so long has affected his family. Kids don't want to talk to him, he's isolated, he has to go to a therapist, and eventually his dad leaves. The worst part being when he drives his mother to suicide, and from there it just keeps going downhill. He still won't break this idea that he's a robot, and so to try and become like what he truly thinks he is on the inside, he goes and uses his mother's inheritance on surgery that removes all of his limbs and replaces them with prosthetics. Things briefly look up for him when he meets a girl who isn't bothered by this. Well, more so she doesn't really realize what he's doing. But it's short-lived when he shaves his head, removes his ears and tongue, adds metal plates into his cheeks, and changes his name to B7. I was loving where it was going, just being this somber car wreck watching this guy destroy his entire life. But it lost me by the end when he just... 
bricks out of it randomly on his 21st birthday, and knowing he has nothing more to live for, he drives to the junkyard and crushes himself. Wonderful. Feels like they were reaching the page limit and wanted a quick conclusion. I don't mind Tim breaking out of it or whatever. In fact, I was quite sad seeing him realize that he pretty much wasted his whole life. But still, I wish maybe there were more reasoning behind him suddenly stopping thinking he was an animatronic. B7, though, is still one of the best stories in the whole series, including in Fazbear Frights. I loved it a lot, and I really couldn't think of a better way to end this. Both these books have epilogues, much like Fazbear Frights again, but I don't see much point in me discussing them. I mean, it's like if I were to watch the first 20 minutes of a movie and then just turn it off. But hey, we're finally done! It only took three hours and a month out of my life. This was a nightmare! I am glad to see, though, that Tales from the Pizza Plex is appearing to be much more of a consistent quality compared to Fazbear Frights. But it might be too soon to call that since, again, we're only like two books in. Apparently, the next one was leaked somehow in its entirety, so despite being delayed till December, a lot of folks have read it already. And from what I've been hearing, it may just be the greatest book in the entire franchise. So who knows? Maybe I'll keep up with them in my own time to see what all the hype is about. I can't lie and say this wasn't an incredibly draining experience, but I think that's mostly my fault. These books had months between releases, but I, in my infinite wisdom, decided I would try and read them all in a month. But I did it, and I don't completely regret it. I think every time I explore part of the FNAF universe I initially wanted no part in, I'm more often than not very surprised at how I feel about him in the end. None of these are like, high art or anything, but I can't lie and say I didn't thoroughly enjoy myself. I think we peaked with the original novel trilogy, which is sad to think about considering it was the first three of over 20 books, but Fazbear Fright still had its merits as a clever way to continue the books. The graphic novels were either a fun way to revisit these stories, or a complete shit, and Tales from the Pizzaplex is looking to be a solid continuation with a fresh coat of paint. Now the question is, what do I do next? This is like a Halloween tradition on my channel now. I can only hope the security breach ruins DLC releases sooner rather than later. Or maybe I could do a big merchandise video instead and cover that stuff. No matter what though, one thing's for sure, just like the rest of the franchise, the quality will widely vary.